in on what is an ABC, a tumor or not? How should we stage and classify an ABC? What are the clinical aspects? How shall we reach a diagnosis? And in the end, what are the treatment options? Aneurysma bone cyst are about the 1.4% of the primary bone tumors and the 15% of all spinal bone tumors. Their prevalence is 0 0.32 for 100,000 inhabitants per year. We have 192 patients affected every year in Italy. We have young patients, their age range from 8 to 26 years old, and for out and of five are patients under 20 years old. And there is a little predominance of the female. In our institution registry, from 19 to 2017, we find that aneurysm cyst are the 8.9% of the primitive neoplasm with an additional 2.5% found, found in the sacrum. ABC histopathologically has been matter of a debate for ages. Is it a tumor or not? A classical example is a young male, 11 years old, with pain with the no neurological, um, neurologic and uh, large, large cavity with a typical fluid fluid level prevalently in the posterior elements. In the, the book uh, published on the 1999, written by Mario Campanacci, this lesion was reported in the tumor-like lesion chapter. And also in 2002, classification of tumors by the World Health Organization, we find the neurismal bone cyst in the undefined neoplastic and nature category. While in the same classification in 2020, we find it in osteoblastic giant cell rich tumors, so defined like a tumor. Again, in this last classification, we find the definition of an aneurysmal bone cyst as a benign osteoclastic giant cell rich tumor containing multinucleated blood filled cystic spaces. This lesion could be one solitary lesion, and there are recognized uh, as a real aneurysmal bone cyst in which. Uh, we find a rearrangement of USP6 gene in 70% of the cases with CDH11 USP6 fusion in 30% of the cases. Second, and the secondary lesion that are categorized like ABC-like lesion in which we don't find translocation. Aneurysmal bone cyst like lesion present in many other tumors such as chondrosarcoma, chondroblastoma, osteoblastoma, fibrous dysplasia, giant histiocytic fibroma, hemangioma, and metastasis and other tumors. Macroscopically, macroscopically, um, they appear as a cystic uh, spaces filled by with blood with uh, a thin cell shell of reactive bone whereas uh, solid areas are unusual microscopically we find osteoblastic uh, osteoclastic like uh, multinucleated uh, giant cells surrounded by stromal mononuclear and myofibroblastic cells and fibrillar and osteoid component the patient arrive at our attention with pain, sometimes with uh, some neurologic problems. 
At X-ray and CT, osteolytic sometimes with the rim of a thin cortical bone layer, MRI and CT with contrast fluid fluid level. About the differential diagnosis, we have to mainly distinguish aneurysmal bone cyst from teleangiectatic osteosarcoma, simple bone cyst, giant cell tumor, primary hyperparathyroidism metastasis. As you can see, these two images uh, appear like uh, similar, but uh, one is an aneurysmal bone cyst and the other is a giant cell tumor uh, with uh, some uh, ABC-like uh, lesions. Have a look uh, of these two cases. Uh, they could appear quite similar, lithic on the CT and with cystic fluid levels on MRI, but actually they be belong uh, to two complete different entities. The first uh, one is an aneurysmal bone cyst. The second one is a bre breast carcinoma metastasis with the fluid cyst in it. The treatment is completely different without the proper diagnosis. The fate of the patient could be a disaster. This is the other two lesion, quite similar in images, but uh, the first is an aneurysmal bone cyst, and the second one is a fibrous sarcoma. And so, um, you can see these uh, images of 11 uh, years old male with thoracolumbar pain, neurological intact diagnosis. Uh, and so um, we, we have to think about uh, what is the diagnosis. And so the first step is uh, to perform a biopsy is the mainstay of the diagnosis in front of uh, every spine lesion of undetermined uh, origin. Imaging uh, is uh, not imaging is not enough in the mass part of the cases. According to Anakin surgical staging of musculoskeletal sarcoma, the benign lesions are distinguished in inactive, active, and aggressive. ABC can belong to each group. Inactive lesions are incidentally found, no symptom is present. Active lesions create pain because a tumor is slowly growing, creating a surrounding reactive capsule inside the same compartment. Aggressive lesions are able to pervade tissue also outside the initial compartment. They do not give metastasis. Modern ABC therapy is based on the following techniques. Selective arterial embolization, which we can define as the first choice, mesenchymal stem cells injection, denosumab, local intralesional injection. Surgical treatment should be the left, should be left to cases that do not respond to less aggressive therapy or when the spine stability or the neurological step, uh, safety is at the risk. The concept behind the efficacy of the local injection is the osteoclastic plus angiogenesis inhibition of the stromal necrotic aftect. Many different substances, substances uh, have been used, calcitonin and methyl metilprednisolone, uh, doxycycline, uh, phenol, bleomycin. The gold standard treatment nowadays is a selective arterial embolization. Its effect is the reduction of the cyst size. It can be repeated multiple times till the cyst is extinguished. In, flavor, in favor of this treatment are the following factor, factors. The low risk, uh, good result reported in literature, if not effective, does not prevent surgery afterwards, and in any case, 
uh, limits surgical blood loss. Summarizing, selective arterial embolization is a current gold standard for ABC treatment. Selective arterial embolization should be usually repeated at least two, three times before significant result. The target of, of the procedure is the embolization of the wall lesion in each procedure in order to prevent a revascularization. Let's see, let's see a successfully uh, embolization case. This is a young man, 23 years old, with paresthesia in the right arm without any other neurological involvement. Was diagnosed uh, with C7ABC. The lesion is highly lytic before treatment, but answered pretty well. After two embolization, the almost three years follow-up actually show a huge classification of the cyst, both in the sagittal CT scan and in the axial one. Another therapeutic option is autologous mesenchymal stem cells injection was rational is to simulate, stimulate the intrinsic healing of ABC through their inductive properties. The advantages of the autologous MC, MC, MSC are best biological effect, better differentiation onto on osteogenic lineage, availability, a reduced morbidity. We have reported our result in a recently published paper in selected cases, 14 cases in our series, where the IBC was stage one or two, there was no significant instability and selective arterial embolization was not an option because not feasible, autologous MSC, MS, MCC was a successful. In fact, the result, the result show increased dosification over time, improved clinical outcome, reduction of the VAS score from seven to one after 12 months. Young woman, 20 year, years old, uh, female with neck pain, non-logical issue, CT show a leading lesion in the posterior arch of C1, biopsy confirmed ABC. She was submitted to four mesenchymal stem, stem cells injection in one year's time, withdrawal from uh, L4. We had a clinical and radiological good outcome one year after the beginning of the treatment. Another case of a 13 years old boy come to our clinic with a huge cervical mass with neck and right arm pain, but no neurological problems. Biopsy confirmed the imaging related suspect of ABC. After three embolization, the lesion appeared to be worse than before. The second line treatment was therefore the autologous uh, mesenchyma stem cells injection. After three injection, the IBC result uh, resulted fully, fully ossified. You can see the difference between uh, before mesenchyma cell, um, stem cells in injection, autologous injection, and after that. Also, the MRI show an impressive change after the injection cycle. Another case of successful MC, MSC injection is a 15 year old boy with persistent neck pain after minor trauma. The MRI showed a elaborated fluid, fluid lesion. The CT guided biopsy uh, confirmed ABC. Embolization was not feasible due to the angiographic pattern. The six month follow up has been impressive, both clinically and radiologically, 
with complete symptoms re remission. And this is as a subital view after six months follow up. Another case, a 14 years old girl with progressive non-traumatic neck pain and the evidence of imaging of an erosive lytic lesion starting from C2, open biopsy diagnosed the by, by ABC, she was submitted to selective vertebral embolization with vertebral artery occlusion, thus preventing further embolization treatment at excessive risk of cerebral perfusion issue. Consequently, she was submitted to three uh, mesenchymal stem cells injection cycle in the lapse time of one year. No significant improvement at six month follow up, but after the third injection from the eight month onwards, she started to ossify more and more. Now we have a look at another treatment option still debated. Uh, denosumab is of level of ABC, but considering the similarities between giant cell tumor and ABC, it has been used for ABC in some cases, especially when other options were not effective. Denosumab is a human monoclonal antibody. It uh, inhibits <coughs> rankle, the main osteo osteogenic uh, cytokine. It reduces bone resorption, and the nosumab therapy can lead to complications such as jaw uh, osteonecrosis, sterility, and hypercalcemia. A young woman, 28 years old, presented with neck pain and non-neurological problems, MRI pattern was pathognomonic for ABC. The lesion was massively lytic. The nosumab was started and after seven months, the ossification was consistent. One year after the nosumab had been stopped, she had a recurrence and consequently she started a second, a second denosumab cycle with good response to the treatment. Another example, a 24 years old boy presented with severe left side thoracic radiculopathy. The first treatment was a curettage to relieve symptoms as soon as possible. Then he was submitted to repeated embolization and in the end to a mesenchymal stem cells injection. Results were not still were still not optimal with no new ossification. The decision was then to shift to the nosumab therapy for 10 months. The clinical and radiological result have been promising. No bad. These are the sagittal <coughs> images of the progressive ossification. After two years from the nosumab stop, now recurrence happened, happened and lytic lesion became more evident again. She then had a new mesenchymal cell injection with no significant improvement. Massive emboli, uh, ABC and uh, of uh, L5 and sacrum treated with the seven selective arterial embolization, persistent pain and no radiological response. Started the nosumab with a good radiological result, but the persistent pain, and he decided against our option to undergo surgery in another hospital. Unfortunately, <coughs> he died during surgery due to the massive blood loss. As already stated, nowadays surgery is not the first choice. It should be performed in selected cases only. Pathological fracture that present mechanical instability and severe neurological impairment. The goals of surgery are 
to stabilize the spine and to protect the neurological structures. The primary goal is not to treat the cyst lesion itself. When curettage of the lesion is performed, additional procedure could be associated should as argon be in coagulation, phenol injection, adjuvant radiotherapy and cryosurgery. Also the bone could be filled with bone grafting, augmentation with polymethylmethacrylate, bioactive glass and demineralized bone matrix. In this case of cervical aneurysm of bone cyst, the C6, C7 with pathological fracture of C7 in a 19 years old male, there is progressive neurological impairment with the Asia D a great scale. So posterior decompression and stabilization C3, T1 was urgently performed and five months after surgery, an important recurrence of the lesion is identified. In these pictures, 15 months after treatment with the denosuma, progressive ossification can be identified. This patient, 12 years old with aneurysmal cyst of L1, was affected by thoracolumbar pain, poor in the deambulation. No neurological deficits were present. She was previously treated with two selective arterial embolization. Then at one month of follow-up, clinically a progressive spinal cord compression was present and in MRI, an increment, an increment of uh, uh, the cyst was detected. Corpectomy of L1 is indicated with an additional filling of bone marrow aspirate and the hydroxyapatite scaffold. In these intraoperative pictures, the lesion could be seen before the asportation in the left one and after asportation in the instabilization in the right one. This is a follow-up uh, at nine month follow-up uh, on CT clinically were good clinical recovery and the resorption of the daily activity. This is a follow-up at nine months of NCT. Clinically, there were good clinical recovery and the resumption of the daily activities. In these uh, CT pictures, a comparison between one month and nine month follow-up is shown. Young girl with cervical spain IBC of C6, severe instability, inflexion extension, cervical uh, X-ray, decided to perform the bulking uh, with uh, decompression and with the reconstruction with graft and wires and hollow jacket uh, for one month with very good uh, bone fusion. This is a treatment algorithm proposed by our unit after the ABC diagnosis is obtained if the worsening core damage of unstable pathological fracture is present, the surgical approach was uh, with the decompression and stabilization is indicated. In absence of these clinical features, a conservative approach with selective arterial embolization should be performed with healing aspect after one to five embolization. If not feel Uh, healing is not achieved after four embolization, then infiltration with bone marrow concentrate should be attempted. Uh, healing is expected after one or two infiltration. If not, treatment with denosumab should be started. <coughs> At the end, denosumab is off label, but if you have no other cho uh, choice, you can use it. In conclusion, ABC is a benign bone tumor that doesn't arise from the spine. Biopsy is mandatory to obtain correct diagnosis. Embolization represents the first line of treatment. Consider the bone marrow injection or the endonosumab as a second and third line of treatment. And surgery is indicated only in case of instability and symptomatic cord compression. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, uh, Alessandro Gasprini, for your talk.
it is really conclusive. We learned a lot from it. May I ask you regarding the protocol of using Densio map? Can you tell me what is the dose and for how long we can give it for the patient and if there is any age limit for Densio map? Okay, usually we we made uh, uh, denosumab for, for uh, six months, and uh, every six uh, uh, seven days uh, is uh, intra uh, is subcutaneous uh, infiltration of denosumab, and uh, we made usually uh, the same uh, uh, quantity for giant cell tumors. But the difference is uh, in giant cell tumor, you have to continue the nosumab if not the, the tumor occur. Uh, with ABC, it's possible to control at the beginning and after to treat with uh, stem uh, cells uh, injection. And so it's possible to treat the patient without uh, uh, continuous uh, um, uh, subministration. So, so Alessandro, you give uh, 120 milligram weekly for one month. Yes. Yeah. Uh, then for for uh, every two months, uh, we made follow up control, and we control, and uh, and uh, we usually continue the treatment for six months. So every one month for six months. Every yeah. Okay, and uh, uh, for the current cases. You know, some colleagues, uh, once they saw uh, the ABC, they proceed for uh, curettage, bone graft, and so on. And some cases came uh, to us with recurrence. So can we start from the beginning by giving uh, employization and giving densumab in recurrence yes, it, cases? Especially they yes. usually become aggressive. I, I think uh, that uh, the nozobab is not... Uh, the best treatment for this uh, kind of patient. But uh, I think uh, uh, when you have no other chance, uh, you can use it. Usually uh, embolization is enough. After six, seven embolization sometimes, but uh, usually is effective. Now we, we start with these uh, uh, stem cells uh, injection and we have a very good clinical results and is less aggressive uh, aggressive than embolization, but uh, before to stop uh, one treatment uh, and and to start with the new one, we want to have some uh, other uh, um, confirm. Uh, and so I, I think in the future it's possible that uh, the injection is the best way to treat this, this kind of patient. But nowadays um, embolization uh, remain the best. Treatment. I think uh, uh, surgery is not uh, the best treatment because if you uh, use uh, just uh, surgery, you have a recurrence. And so uh, surgery you, you use just for, to stabilize and to decompress. But after with the surgery, you have to perform embolization or injection of stem cells. Uh, um, uh, curettage and borrage with, uh, um, uh, with the bone marrow or with the uh, um, polymethyl metacrylate is not enough. I, I saw some people, some paper where it's written that uh, they perform uh, and block uh, resection, but I don't understand why. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, I have a question. Uh, the cases that you showed, uh, it seems like unstable. Uh, so, uh, do you feel secure uh, giving the uh, adjuvant therapy as regarding the stem cells or the uh, denzirubab uh, for a period while this uh, uh, cyst is healing? Uh, do you have any concern or do you do any protection uh, just to, for the fear of uh, any secondary uh, uh, fractures happening during this period? I think uh, in, in the case with the uh, uh, cervical spine, is C7, you, you mean, uh, correct? You mean the C7? If you yeah. mean these, uh, I think, uh, uh, posterior stabilization and after the ossification of the anterior part is enough uh, and uh, is difficult that uh, uh, when, when you go to treat uh, with surgery, this kind of ossification is very strong. And so 
it's difficult that uh, there is a secondary fracture, I think. Okay, uh, there is no more uh, questions. Thank you so much, okay. uh, Alessandro, for your presentation. And uh, we hope uh, for your current case you are doing, you are operating uh, uh, all the, the best. And see you in the near future, inshallah. Thank you so much. Okay, Alessandro. thank you very much. Ciao. Ciao to Ciao. everybody. Ciao. Bye. So the second speaker will be Michael uh, Fehling. Michael Fehling uh, is well known as spine surgeon and he has uh, a lot of uh, papers and publications covering all kinds of uh, spine pathologies. And we are happy to have uh, Michael with us will give us a talk regarding personalization, personalizing the management protocols for spine metastasis. Michael, we are happy to hear your presentation. Yeah, thank you very much for the invitation. Just confirming that you can hear my audio and that you- Yes, that you can we can voice. see, we can see as uh, the screen and we can hear your voice. Excellent. Well, it's a pleasure to be part of this, um, of this of this uh, program and enjoyed uh, the previous lecture on uh, on, on on ABCs, uh, which was very uh, educational. So I'll be talking about um, a, a type of a tumor that virtually all practicing neurosurgeons and spine surgeons will will see at least when they're on call. And it's important to realize that this is an evolving landscape. Uh, because the management of, um, of metastatic tumors is evolving, and the way we think about metastatic spine is evolving. And it's very important to, uh, to have a personalized management uh, program to try to tailor the, uh, the management um, for the individual uh, patient. So I have no relevant uh, commercial disclosures. In a different part of my life, I'm very active in in a neuroregenerative uh, technologies and I've spun off a biotech company which is being managed at arm's length. And uh, again, to thank the uh, Neuro-Oncology Committee of the WFNS, thanks to uh, AO Spine as well, and many thanks to Dr. Uh, Same Hassan for the invitation. So I'll present a couple of cases that I've managed just to kind of frame the discussions. So this is a 59-year-old man and what's important is that he was diagnosed 24 years previously with melanoma. And so right off the get-go, he is an outlier, if you think about it, because it's been a long survival. And he presented to me um, about a year after he'd been diagnosed with a pancreatic lesion and, a, and he'd had a splenectomy for tumors. And he presented with this L1 lesion uh, which is um, presenting with focal back pain and some inguinal pain uh, related to compression of the uh, nerve root at that level. And here's a second case that I managed um, maybe about a year and a half ago during my on call. And this is a 49 year old woman with metastatic thyroid follicular cancer. And she's presenting with a very large lesion here um, at T3 with an extradural metastasis, excellent performance status, very significant back pain. And remarkably, despite the degree of cord compression, I uh, did not have evidence of myelopathy, but very significant cord compression. So how are we gonna manage these cases? So let's think about the questions to consider here. So how does prognosis dictate the management of metastatic spine cancer? And which patients will be the outliers? So which ones have longer term survival, which we can define as greater than two years, but also which are the patients that have short term survival, less than three months? And then how can we predict these outcomes and can we move closer to precision based medicine? So where are we now and, and where are we going in the field? And so this discussion is somewhat reminiscent of this book by the University of Toronto professor Malcolm Gladwell called Outlier. There's a story of success, and I would commend the audience to, to have a look at this book. It's quite interesting. So the epidemiology of metastatic uh, spine cancer is increasing, and we're seeing more of these cases. And we can expect greater percentages of long-term survivors because of targeted therapies that are evolving. 
And it's important that these cases be um, considered from a multidisciplinary format and molecular profile with genetic sequencing and the identification of biomarkers can have a very significant impact. So for example, if we consider non-small um, cell lung cancer, the, the prognosis has been dramatically impacted by the identification of various uh, molecular markers. And in particular, the EGFR uh, receptor is associated with substantially improved long-term survival. And this can influence your, your treatments. Androgen-resistant prostate cancers have also um, uh, undergone a significant uh, therapeutic uh, uh, changes. This is just a slide just to illustrate the fact that patients with non-small cell lung cancers have had dramatic uh, shifts in terms of the long-term survival with the targeting of the uh, EGFR receptor. We've also seen targeted therapeutic changes occurring with uh, breast cancer, particular uh, women that have um, uh, estrogen responsive breast cancer and HER2 receptors. And similarly with renal cell cancers, the presence of receptor ty uh, tyrosine uh, kinase uh, markers can influence the treatment. And so this is kind of pushing uh, the envelope. And we've seen other um, advances in adjuvant uh, treatment, including um, a stereotactic uh, radiosurgery, which I'll refer to later on in my lecture. And of course, coming back to uh, the patient that I've uh, presented, uh, the presence of targeted mutations, and particularly the BRAF mutation, can have a very significant influence in outcomes. So in general, the treatment of metastatic spine cancer, of course, is palliative in nature. Um, but it's important, again, to identify these, uh, these outliers and to design personalized approaches for these patients. Now, the management of metastatic spine cancer was um, dramatically shifted with the publication of this randomized trial 17 years ago now in The Lancet by Roy Patchell. And this trial showed that surgical resection as an adjuvant treatment for metastatic spine cancer dramatically improves the outcome. And this has really had a big impact on, on treatment where surgery is a critical cornerstone in the management of these patients. And uh, this um, has now been validated in several prospective studies, including our own multi-center pu uh, publication in Journal of Clinical Oncology that I'll refer to. However, metastatic spine cancer is still a relatively sobering diagnosis. The majority of patients do have relatively short median survivors uh, that is on average between six and 12 uh, months. But again, there are outliers and I would commend this paper uh, by Dr. Verlaine from the Netherlands in Journal of Clinical Oncology. And essentially about 20% of patients uh, succumb within three months and about a quarter of patients are the long-term survivors be beyond two years. And, and I'll explore some of these factors a bit later um, in, in, the le in the lecture. But it's important to recognize this because for patients with very short-term survival, perhaps these patients are gonna be managed palliatively. If you consider an intervention, you'll wanna do something that's quite minimally invasive. The longer-term survivors though need more durable a treatment or else you'll be back in the operating room with local recurrence and treatment failures. So what about clinical prognostic models? How useful are these in terms of the decision-making? Now there's a number of these that have been out there, the Tokuhashi models, the Tomita models and other models. And these have been the classic models, but the reality is in the modern context, as we reviewed a few years ago, these actually have poor predictive ability. And, and unfortunately, they're really more of historical interest now. So what can we use? So what's available? So one um, a clinical prediction model is the New England spine metastasis a score. And uh, this was um, uh, published in, in the spine uh, a journal about seven years ago. And this does allow for some stratification of, uh, of, of, of patients. And then there's the skeletal oncology research group, uh, a nomogram. So this takes into consideration the tumor type, the presence of metastases, 
in simple blood tests, including the hemoglobin, white blood cell count, as well as the performance status. This is some work I was involved with with David Choi through the uh, um, Globe, Global uh, Spine Tumor uh, Study Group, and this was a, uh, a risk uh, uh, a, a, a calculator, but this hasn't been widely adopted, mainly because this has been principally used for research purposes through members of the Global Spine Tumor Study Group. This risk calculator that we developed um, through the AO is widely available, and it may be something that you would consider using. This was published two years ago in, um, in World uh, Neurosurgery. And this is the only clinical prediction model that assesses survival as well as quality of, of life. And it's important uh, to consider the type of tumor, so breast, thyroid, and prostate have um, improved survival and quality of, of life. Um, oligometastatic um, uh, disease, as well as the Karnofsky performance status are critical factors. And then it's also important to consider the relative frailty of the patient. And uh, this is an effort uh, to take this into consideration. This is the metastatic spine tumor of frailty um, uh, index. This um, is illustrated here. So in addition uh, to uh, the patient's general uh, status, you can assess uh, whether the patient has evidence of malnutrition, uh, is there evidence of coagulopathy, is there evidence of lung disease or anemia? And these will uh, significantly impact on outcomes and our measures of frailty. So optimally, the treatment for metastatic spine disease is a multidisciplinary in nature and this is to tailor the treatment to the individual uh, patient. And, and so I think whenever possible, a multidisciplinary team discussions of the management of these patients is optimal. I also really like the GNOMES framework um, uh, that was um, uh, developed by Mark Bilski's group at Sloan Kettering. And this takes into consideration four decision uh, factors, the neurology, the oncologic uh, factors of so the type of tumor, is there mechanical instability and in the systemic disease? And this is shown here. So one could look at tumor response, the expected response to radiation and systemic therapy. But the reality is, is that this is shifting. And so some tumors, for example, renal cell cancer that were previously considered to be radio resistant, now are radio sensitive with, with a more advanced uh, radiation uh, algorithms. And similarly, Tumors that were previously felt to be uh, resistant uh, to chemotherapy. So for example, non-small cell forms of, of lung cancer, if there's EGFR receptor positivity, will be responsive um, to uh, chemotherapeutic uh, algorithms. So SBRT, a stereotactic body radiotherapy, um, ha has been a positively disruptive uh, technology. And this is uh, overcome radio resistance. And this is the paper by Arjun Segal um, from our a unit in Toronto published in the, in the Lancet uh, now about a decade ago, describing uh, uh, this, this, uh, this technique. And this has led to the concept of hybrid surgery, where you combine um, separation uh, surgical techniques with uh, SBRT. And, and this has now become uh, an excellent uh, option uh, for, uh, for example, renal cell um, uh, cancers. And this has big advantages over more extensive resection by reducing morbidity, reducing operating um, uh, at, at time. But one needs to be careful here because one needs to assess the structural stability. So one needs to then also consider um, a, a minimally invasive decompressive surgery with the potential need uh, uh, to augment this either with um, methyl methacrylate in the vertebral body or with, uh, for example, minimally invasive pedicle screw uh, reconstruction. And other techniques are evolving, including the use of spine laser interstitial uh, thermal therapy, which is a percutaneous uh, technology to optimize um, SBRT techniques via cytoreduction from controlled heating or cooling. And then there's increased interest in targeted uh, uh, therapies with a SBRT radio sensitizers. It's important to consider the oncologic stability. 
and the spine neoplastic uh, uh, scale is a particular value and you need to consideration the spinal uh, location. So whether this is in a rigid area or a junctional area, the presence of mechanical pain is, is very important. Whether it's a lytic, blastic or mixed lesion, whether there's evidence of deformity or subluxation, the extent of vertebral body collapse and the extent of involvement of the posterior spinal elements. And these factor into consideration in the SIN score. Other minimally invasive options have become available. And of course, balloon kyphoplasty is now a well-validated technique. This is the classic CAFE study that was published in Lancet Oncology about 10 years ago, uh, showing the value of this uh, modality in certain types of patients. For example, patients with myeloma who have compression fractures are dramatically benefited by vertebroplasty or kyphoplasty. And uh, these are in general safe techniques, particularly if the posterior wall is intact. These can be applied in skilled hands if the posterior wall is not intact, but this requires a, a very careful uh, a touch in here potentially an anterior placed balloon kyphoplasty technique might be uh, an option. And then um, a minimally um, uh, invasive uh, uh, techniques are becoming more widely adopted and these represent an interesting option to consider. Now, is there still a role for maximally invasive procedures on block resections of certain oligometastatic lesions? And classically, these have been used for renal cell cancer and for functionally secreting metastases, such as the thyroid cancer in the patient I presented at the outset. So this is a paper uh, here by Dan Scuba and, and colleagues from the United States um, reporting their experience with on-block resections of primary metastatic spine uh, tumors and metastatic renal cell cancer. This has been the classic treatment. But the caveat is that now with embolization followed by a radical subtotal resection, reconstruction and stereotactic radiosurgery is, is, an, is an excellent uh, option that um, in Toronto has largely supplanted the use of uh, on-block resection for these lesions. And then in addition, um, on-block resection is, a, um, is an option for a solitary functionally secreting spinal metastases. So for example, the patient with the thyroid cancer that I presented at the outset. So this is our paper from Journal of Clinical Oncology. And essentially this was a prospective multi-center validation of the, of the um, patchel a trial. And here we show that surgical intervention as a complementary adjunct to medical treatment improved outcomes, in particular enhanced quality of life outcomes. And this was a novel addition to Patchell's a trial. Most common uh, tumors are lung, kidney, breast, and uh, 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 prostates. Uh, most patients, but certainly not all, had oligometastatic disease in this series. Now you'll see this is all comers and prospective series. This number is being shifted, but still, this is a relatively uh, contemporary series. And you see in general, again, what I was referring to, the average survival between six and 12 uh, months. But again, critically important to determine uh, the outliers. The type of primary tumor, presence of visceral metastases, and the baseline functional scores um, are critical factors in determining uh, the outcomes. So we have a rapidly evolving landscape with a multiple of, uh, of, tr of treatment options as shown here. So, and then how do we select uh, the patients for these therapies? And this, this is really where the judgment comes in. So who are the longer term survivors? And this is uh, this paper, we were privileged to be part of this uh, group. This is JJ Farlan uh, from the uh, um, AO uh, Spine Tumor Knowledge uh, Forum. So predictors of greater than two-year survival after surgery are a favorable primary tumor, breast, prostate, and thyroid, and oligometastatic disease with a one vertebral level involved. So these are the ideal patients. And then questions to consider that, that um, uh, are, are currently um, a knowledge gaps that, that we need to examine are you know, further defining the factors that are associated with long-term survival and whether these factors are modifiable. How aggressively should we treat these groups? And then what therapies alter the uh, survivor? So what about the patients with a, a short, very short survival? What do we do with these patients? 
Well, you certainly don't want to be doing a big on block resection in these patients or, or a huge uh, surgery, but one also needs to avoid the trap of being overly ni um, nihilistic. So potentially um, one could uh, consider um, offering minimally invasive options to try to enhance the quality of life and reduce uh, pain. And typically as shown here in these uh, survival plots, um, uh, you, uh, these uh, um, short-term survivors typically make up about 15% of, of, of these study of, of, of cohorts. And while traditionally the goal has been to predict a survival, we also need to consider a quality of life uh, outcomes. And again, the use of various uh, algorithms to, to assess these prognostic factors can be uh, um, uh, helpful. And again, this is the um, spinal oncology um, a surgical uh, nomogram. So uh, for radiotherapy, for metastatic spinal cord compression, this remains a critical uh, a, a factor. And in Toronto, we certainly would be offering palliative radiation to patients with short-term survival to improve, to improve uh, a pain. And um, this is a paper uh, here reporting on uh, survival scores and the, the groupings for patients in, in radiotherapeutic um, uh, in this radiotherapeutic series. And you'll you'll see here the importance of the Karnofsky performance status or the KPS um, as, a, as a determinant of, of outcomes. And uh, factors associated with less than three months survival after SBRT um, in, in, include uh, patients with, with um, polymetastatic disease, large paraspinal um, uh, lesions, and then non-breast, non-prostate uh, types of, um, types of uh, tumors. So again, being able to distinguish these outliers becomes quite important in having uh, the judgment and the knowledge in terms of how uh, to do this. So knowledge of the factors associated with short-term survival, thinking about how best to try to treat these uh, patients with a focus on, on enhancing quality of life. So I'll just come back to the two patients, both of whom are outliers in terms of the longer term survival. So here's this 59 year old man and it turns out with metastatic melanoma and it turned out that sure enough, the molecular diagnostics showed that he was BRAF positive. He had a positive response to targeted immunotherapeutic treatments. Um, and then I managed him with a short segment um, pedicle screw reconstruction and a radical local resection. He received local radiotherapy and he survived over 10 years before eventually succumbing from his disease. And this is the second patient with the excellent performance status. She has a, uh, she has, um, a thyroid follicular carcinoma, large T3 uh, extradural metastasis, very favorable anatomy for uh, an on block resection. And this is in fact what was done. But the important caveat here is the use of adjuvant uh, embolization. This is a critical treatment in vascular lesions, including renal cell thyroid and hepatocellular uh, carcinoma. And this is exactly uh, what we did with this patient. So she's had a radical resection, short segment pedicle screw fixation, SBRT and chemotherapy, and she's had an excellent outcome and is currently tumor free, neurologically intact. So take home messages. Treatment of metastatic spine disease is focused on enhancement of quality of life. We focus on pain and neurological function. Clinical prediction models and molecular diagnostics are enabling more accurate prediction of the outliers. SBRT has opened the door to radiotherapeutic treatment of tumors previously felt to be radioinsensitive. So for example, <laughs> renal cell carcinoma. Long-term survival and the, and the availability of adjuvants, including SBRT and chemotherapy, can positively influence the decision to undertake a more aggressive surgical treatment. And one could consider less aggressive management strategies in patients with shorter than expected uh, survival. And on that note, uh, I'll close. Thank you again and happy to take questions. Thank you, Michael, for your presentation. Uh, may I ask you regarding the vertebroplasty management for spine tests? There is published paper in the Nature 
telling that once you are doing vertebroplasty for patients, you are increasing the amount of uh, circulating uh, metastatizing cells in the body, and they may increase the incidence of uh, other uh, metastases in other sites. What do you think about this paper? Yeah, I mean, I think that that's, um, it, you, you likely will um, uh, cause the microscopic metastasis um, if the treatment is only going to be a um, vertebroplasty uh, alone. So we would uh, uh, suggest um, uh, a multimodality type of a treatment. So for example, focused radiation to the lesion in association with the vertebroplasty or potentially the use of a vertebroplasty approach with a local cytoreductive te technique with a thermal ablation kind of uh, type of an approach and also with a kind of ongoing uh, adjuvant uh, chemotherapy. And with this kind of an algorithm, you can avoid that disadvantage from, um, uh, from occurring. Okay, great. Any questions? Shabab, had the habis al Okay, thank you so much, Michael, for your presentation. And uh, hope uh, to see you again in the near future. Thank you so much, Michael. Very, very good. Pleasure to be here. Take care. Hello, Dr. Alves. Hello, Oscar. Hello, Mike. Nice meeting you. Good to see you. And I see, see Professor you. Joel and many friends are on. Okay. Take care and uh, be well. Bye-bye. Uh, our dear friend, uh, Oscar Alves from Portugal. He visited Egypt before, and we are happy to have him uh, between us will give us uh, uh, a talk covering the intradural tumors. Oscar, please deliver your talk. Thank you so much for being a part of our uh, meeting. Hello, it's, it's my real privilege to be such a, a giant of uh, spine surgery. Uh, Michael Goel, uh, all the other people, uh, good people pre presenting here. So my, my topic is uh, on, on craniovertebral giants and intradural tumors. And I'll try to present you some useful uh, surgical anatomy tips for a, a successful surgery. So I, I don't have any any uh, one. I'm sorry, just uh, okay. Can you see me now? Second slide. No. I'm sorry, just a little technical problem here. Yes, we can see it right now. Right. So I have no relevant disclosures for this presentation, except the, the, my mentorship, the mentorship and friendship with, uh, with Professor Bernard George, uh, with whom I trained and everything I know from this uh, area. I, it's, it's, uh, I have to pay tribute to him. And this is one of the monographies that we publish in operative techniques in neurosurgery. Uh, so you have in this region, cardiovascular junction uh, arena, a very intricate neurovascular anatomy from very dense from uh, from neurology point of view, the medulla, uh, elongata, the spinal cord, it adds to that all the, 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 the lower cranial nerves. So and anybody that wants to operate in this area has to have a very solid knowledge of, this, of the anatomy. And for me, the most important, the key element for, for a successful surgery in this area is really the control and of the vertical artery. So you have the, the V4 segment, the intradural, that, that extends intradurally from the foramen magnum and unites to the contralateral vertical artery to form the basilar artery. And you have the V3 segment from the C2 uh, transverse foramen to the foramen, like, as you see here. Uh, if you look at the vertebral artery on the sagittal plane, it is more anterior at the uh, C6-7 and then travels posteriorly. So it's really more vulnerable when you're doing posterior surgery at C0, C1, C2 level. Uh, you can damage the vertebral artery and in 20% of cases it will uh, occur during the, the approach. 
And of course, less uh, case volume surgeons will have higher rates of virtual artery injury. So that's why training with simulator, can have a workshops, uh, the lectures that we are doing here, and fast, uh, find the experience uh, surgeons and mentors. It's very important to increase your expertise. Uh, so at looking at P3, there are important sites of the risk of the atherogenic injury of the vertebral artery. Whenever you are exposing the vertebral artery, even for a simple PRE surgery, uh, from, from medial to lateral, uh, with, with your unipolar cautery, you can damage the vertebral artery here in this situation in the groove. Also, when you do soft tissue dissection uh, on, on the lateral suboccipital region, the vertebral artery can bulge posteriorly in this uh, suboccipital triangle. Uh, and of course, when you work a little bit lower on the dorsal surface of C2, you have also very close the vertebral artery, and you have to be aware of that. Uh, as you see here, uh, vertebral artery uh, close to occipital bone. Uh, in even in some 10% of patients, you don't see any separation from the occipital. Uh, and this was a pseudoaneurysm caused by the atherogenic injury of unipolar cancer using the midline of midline dissection. Then you have to, to understand that there are variations and anomalies of V3, uh, for example, a, a extracranial uh, origin of pike, as you see here, or kind of fenestrations of the vertebral artery. Uh, again, as you see here, extradural origin of, of, of pike, um, and all these kind of fenestrations that are very important to always look at your scans, before you embark in doing surgery. And of course, if you have bone anomalies with different embryological origins, you should always suspect of a modified course of the vertebral artery. Here are complete assimilation of the atlas, atlas aplasia. So this will efface your anatomical landmarks for uh, locating uh, the vertebral artery. Or the foramen arquale, which is uh, quite often and it will be mistaken uh, as a widened arch of the atlas, and it will be very difficult laterally to expose the vertebral artery in the groove. Also, some patients, they can have tumors, but also other kind of diseases, like the classical example is rheumatoid arthritis, where you think there is a disease-induced effacement of all these uh, landmarks. So, some of the time you need incorporated navigation and you might need even incorporated geography to find uh, your vertebral artery. And why, why this is important? Because there is a, an incertitude principle. If you look at, for example, these two cases, uh, the relation of the vertebral artery with the tumor is completely different. Vertebral artery can be displaced, for example, in this case of cervical neuronoma, can be displaced anteriorly or posteriorly. So there is this variable location of the vertebral artery in relation to the tumor. So for a successful surgery, you have to first see and control the enemy. The enemy here is going to be the vertebral artery. Is it possible to identify the vertebral artery to dissect around the vertebral artery? Of course it is. Uh, the, the, the vertebral artery is surrounded, as you see here, by a venous plexus, and both of them are enclosed on a, on a continuous superiosteal sheet that is continuous with the periosteum of the transverse foramen and the, the foramen magnum dura mater. And the, the vertebral artery is free mobile within this uh, superiosteal field. So if you do really a very meticulous superiosteal dissection, uh, this can be done without any risk of the vertebral artery. Of course, you will get some bleeding, it's expectable, but it's going to be a uh, venous bleeding that is solved with a soft regulation and uh, tampering. This is just one of my cases uh, in lower cervical spine. You see a stop of the flow of the vertebral artery. This was a, a chondrosarcoma. And after we we controlled the vertebral artery above and below the lesion, we extracted the tumor. And you see the nice flow of the vertebral artery that was not really uh, collapsed or invaded by the tumor. Unfortunately, this is uh, there, there are caveats. That's not always a situation that is uh, Superiosteal sheath invasion by tumors. This is a case of osteocytosis here. Uh, so it might be, in some cases, impossible to accomplish. And the classical examples are, are metastasis, uh, osteocytosis, 
aneurysmal uh, uh, cysts. So if you look at carefully the anatomy of the vertebral artery in this region, uh, you see that there are these loops of the vertebral artery around the C1 transverse foramen and in the groove of, of the atlas, of the posterior arch of the atlas. So if this can be mobilized uh, backwards or upwards, and we can take advantage of the existence of those loops to mobilize the vertebral artery. And like that, we gain access to the pathology that it's hidden by the vertebral artery. Here, an example on dry bone on cadaver, the, the arch of C1. This is an antrolateral perspective and the surgical view here. Uh, and this is basically from an antrolateral perspective where what you can do and gain uh, access to lateral wall of the, the C1, C0, C1, C2 region. My topic today is to focus more on, on the postulateral perspective. So the growth of the vertebral artery, the medial border of the vertebral artery is around eight millimeters from the midline. So if you want to go and access on a more anterior position, uh, you have to go laterally, which means that you have to transpose the vertebral artery from the arch of C1. And this will allow you a wider exposure and less spinal cord retraction. Uh, this is the classical transnasal, transoral anterior approach, the posterior midline approach. And you have the anterolateral approach that I showed you before, or, and the posterolateral approach. And those lateral approaches to the kind of uh, vertebral junction implies the mobilization of the vertebral artery. And there is minimal bone drilling to preserve stability. So you don't need to stabilize those patients. And my algorithm is intradural tumors. Most of them can be approached by a prostolateral uh, way, or if you have extradural tumors on this region, tumor tumors, you better to do an antrolateral approach. You know, there is an excess of space for the content of this uh, region from C0 to C2. For example, at the level of C1, the mean inner AP dimension is over 3 centimeters, which is the double of the size of the spinal cord. So there is a, a, an important mismatch, mismatch between the canal and its contents. Uh, there is very generous space that will allow for the silent growth of tumors. So whenever you, you have tumors to operate on this region, you probably will have, you are facing the tumor, which is not a problem because the tumor will create the surgical corridor, will make your life easier. And these are the, the individual tumors that we have done over the years, the meningioma, uh, almost all of them are intradural, only 4% are extradural. And neurinomas, uh, almost 40% can have also an extradural component. But you can also find epidermoids, melanomas, microblastomas, uh, at any moment. Uh, so back to the, the concept of the, the, the postrolateral approach. So this is your classical midline approach. You see, you don't gain much excess. But if you go laterally, you can reach the condyle. The, the, the C0, C1 joint. This is the postnolateral approach, and you really get a wide, uh, nice exposure. Uh, this is that what you see here: the groove of the vertebral artery. There is always this step. The size, the height of the arch is smaller, but the, 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 there is a good variability in the height and extent of the vertebral groove. This is not equal for all patients, so you have to pay attention. Another very important concept that I would like you to take home is the need to, to do or not condylization. I don't think we need to do a lot of condylization, it's very minimal. And this is the reason. The neuroaxis, if you, if you draw a line on the posterior border of the C0, C1 joint, you draw a, a line, the neuroaxis is all posterior to C0, C1 joint, which is not the case in subaxial C spine, where the joints are posterior, uh, a lot posterior to the, to the neuroaxis. So, no contrived drilling or, drilling or instrumentation is required for most of the intradural tumor surgery. The extent of drilling, of course, is dictated by the location of the tumor. You don't, if you have a more posterior located tumor, you don't need to do a lot of uh, lateral drilling. 
Another important key concept is after you do your bone occipital work, C1 work, uh, you do this kind of incision of the dura and then a hockey stick incision and then a counter incision to the entry point of the vertebral artery intradurally. And this will give you a wide exposure to the tumor and control of the vertebral artery and the lower cranial nerves. Another very important concept is the relation of the tumor to the vertebral artery. Is that, this is something you have to understand from your preoperative scan. Is the tumor below? Is it above? Is it above and below? Um, if you have a tumor that is all below the vertebral artery, you be sure that the cranial nerves are displaced superiorly away from the tumor. If you have the situation where the tumor is above or above and below, uh, you have to have a different surgical strategy because the displacement of the cranial nerves is unpredictable. So you have to be bold first a lot, and then you have to control the capsule and you change the bulking with uh, working around the capsule. As I said before, you have to, if you have a tumor with a, a more lateral location, you do a little bit more drilling laterally, uh, as it is the case here on this tumor. If it is a completely anterior located tumor, which is more difficult, what can be done, what I do, is normally to work on both sides alternatively and transpose the vertebral artery on both sides so you can have access from one side and the other to completely remove the tumor. This, this is my personal series, uh, 29 cases, no surgical morbidity, complete resection, three cases of CSF, uh, this word that were solved uh, without any problem, and only two uh, cases in 29 of worsening of neurological deficit. So without this technique of mobilizing the virtual artery, this is going to be very hard to achieve uh, those results. And this is uh, some of our cases, uh, pre- and, and, and post-operative. So, uh, as a sort of a conclusion, the, the, the virtual artery mobilization and cranial virtual junction in the of tumors, we need to do really a, a careful preoperative planning for uh, accounting form for vascular anomalies and the first vascular surgical anatomy. Very important to do this superiority of section to allow a safe mobilization of the virtual artery, which is essential to control the virtual artery, proximal and distal to the tumor. Uh, this is the key step for complete recession with limited morbidity. And since you are respecting most of the lateral wall of the cranial vertebrae junction, there is no need for stability. So what was once considered no man's land uh, has become expert's land. And this is really due to the fact that you can control and uh, mobilize the vertebral axis. Uh, and this is a... Uh, for the first time we were together on a cadaver lab around the virtual actor in the edge with the late uh, Professor Joyce. Uh, thank you for, for your time. Well, Mike Michelle. Oscar, thank you so much for your presentation. So uh, I am happy that uh, the vertebral artery, you can dissect and manipulate it because uh, always as a spine surgeon, once you are uh, tackling C1, uh, C2 and uh, doing surgery around this area, we are afraid uh, from touching the vertebral artery. So uh, you, ca you can dissect and Manipulate it. So, what 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 is your protocol of management if you hit the vertebral artery? If we have injury of the vertebral artery at the procedure at the index surgeon, so can you give us a flow for what to do? Right. So, if you have an injury of the vertebral artery, it, it really depends what kind of surgery we are do, you are doing. Of course, I mean, uh, if you you have also to have beforehand uh, an idea what's the dominant vertebral artery. It's very different if you. Injury a vertebral a dominant or a non-dominant. If you don't, if you hit a, a non-dominant artery, usually it doesn't happen much trouble. It, it's something that uh, patients can tolerate. On the other hand, it will, it will be a disaster. 
but also it depends what you are doing. If you're putting screws or if you're operating tumors at different uh, situations. Uh, for example, if I'm doing instrumentation on this area, what I do is always to uh, do the safest uh, side first. Uh, and if I have a problem with the screw, um, you know, you just leave the screw in place. It will help to tamponate the situation uh, and, and don't, don't, don't take the, the, the screw out, okay? But, uh, you know, most of the time, fortunately, the, venous, the, 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 the bleeding, the pattern of bleeding, it's not a full-blown uh, explosion. It's really venous bleeding that you can with patient uh, tamponade. And I see Professor Google here, my friend, and I learned from him, and recently I did some cases, a couple of cases, where for C2 screws, uh, you can mobilize the vertebral artery and find your very nice entry point to the, to the pedicle. Um, so, of course, then if you have all these disasters, you, you, you should do a, a, an angiography immediately, post -operative. Try to tamponate if you can also do some, some uh, repair, vascular repair, which is not easy. Uh, depends on, on how much you have exposed the vertebral artery. But certainly, you know, try to do your best pecking and take it to, to, to uh, angiography and see what, uh, what needs to be done, stenting or whatever. And uh, last case scenario, ligation of the vertebral artery, to, to, you know, to, to not lose the patient. Okay, thank you, uh, Oscar. Is there is any questions for Oscar? So thank you so much, Oscar, for your presentation, and I hope to see you again in Egypt. And uh, thank you so much. There is thank no you. more questions. Thank you. Thank so you. The, thank you, Oscar. Uh, yeah, so that's cool. Thank so you. Oscar. Nice to see you again. <laughs> thank you, Oscar. Thank you. Oscar, everything okay? Fine, fine. I will, I will stay to enjoy your lecture. <laughs> okay. Great. Okay. So, so the next speaker will be Dr. Hassan Salhin. Dr. Hassan, uh, originally from Egypt, but uh, he is working in Germany. Dr. Hassan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Assalamu alaikum, Dr. Muhammad Diwasa. Hassan, Rabbi na ikrima ka hamish. Shaifin surtak wala shaifin presentation. Mom, can you share? شايفني كده؟ اه تمام شايفينك كده. السلام عليكم دكتور محمد وفا. كل سنه وحضرتك طيب. ازي سعادتك يا بيه؟ دكتور سامح ازيكم جميعا. الله يبارك فيك. ثانك يو فور ذيس نايس انفيتيشن. ال جاست ستارت ماي توك سوري اباوت ذا ديفرنت ستراتيجيز فور ذا مانجمنت اوف سباينال ميتاستاتيك ليجنز. Uh, just uh, as an introduction, 50% of the patients with metastatic lesions die on complications of uh, metastasis, usually um, general uh, complications, multiple uh, organ failure. In 50 to 80% of the patients with evidence of uh, bony metastasis, there are also spinal metastasis detectable in 50 to 80% of these patients. About, it, about 20 percent of the spinal metastases violate the spinal canal threatening neurological deficit. The most common tumors causing spinal metastases are breast cancer, bronchogenic carcinoma and cancer prostate. The cervical period in months varies according to the degree of malignancy of the primary tumor. The multiple myeloma has a good cervical survival rate in comparison to the prostatic carcinoma. Lung, bladder, and pancreas tumors are much more aggressive than thyroid, breast, and prostatic tumors. So to make a reasonable decision about the surgery that should be done in such critical patients, we need to carefully evaluate three main points. Number one, the medical fitness and general condition of the patient. Number two, the clinical problems and symptoms caused by the spinal metastasis, and number three, the oncological status of uh, the tumor and the patient. Uh, these points should be discussed interdisciplinary in a tumor conference together with an oncologist, radiotherapist, and uh, internist. So number one, the general uh, uh, patient condition and general factors uh, such as overall health, nutritional status, medical comorbidities 
should be considered before uh, recommending any type of surgery. And you have to ask yourself if the patient can survive a major surgery or he will end miserably intubated in the, the intensive care unit. Regarding the clinical presentation of the metastasis, the most important factor is uh, the neurological deficits leading to recumbency and loss of mobility. And this is one of the most fatal complications of the metastatic disease. Bit sources, pneumonia, urinary tract infection, sepsis are fatal complications in Anna? such patients. Basically, they're on Netflix. Excuse me? So the neurological evaluation of these patients and his images uh, are a crucial uh, uh, point for the operative decision. Analysis of the mechanical pain is essential to decide uh, whether to do a surgery or a fixation or not, because the recumbency and loss of mobility, as said, is one of the most fatal uh, complications of the uh, spinal metastasis uh, disease. Regarding the spinal uh, instability, uh, the well-known spinal instability neoplastic score helps us uh, to uh, make an overview of the metastatic lesion according to the type, the location, the size, and the anatomical extension of the metastatic lesion according to the severity of pain, the amount of collapse of the vertebral body. You can decide if a lesion is stable or not, need, uh, needs fixation or not. Uh, these regarding uh, multiple morbid patients, non-operable orthosis might be a reasonable uh, decision if you are not going uh, to do a fixation or you cannot do any fixation in such patients. Number three, the oncological status uh, of the patient is a very important factor to evaluate the aggressiveness uh, of the uh, tumor, the primary tumor, the aggressiveness of the uh, metastatic lesion is a radio sensitive, uh, which uh, 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 therapy regime can be used in these uh, patients. The problem is you uh, you don't have always a minimal invasive uh, access or approach to take a biopsy. And in some patients who are, are impending uh, 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 severe neurology with paraplegia or quadriplegia, you uh, might need to do an excisional uh, biopsy without knowing or suggestion of the primary lesion. And this can be a difficult uh, situation. So uh, if a, a metastatic lesion is uh, detected in the spine, we go immediately for staging and it should, uh, should uh, take uh, not uh, a lot of time and should be done as soon as possible. A CT of the whole uh, trunk from uh, chest, abdomen, and pelvis to evaluate the metastasis also of the vital organs. And that can help you to detect the primary lesion in the lung or in the liver or to detect under, uh, other uh, metastatic lesions in the vital organs. And of course, you can evaluate uh, other uh, uh, metastatic lesions in the whole uh, spine. Then we go for MRI examination of the affected spine uh, region. And if you are not sure, you can go for MRI uh, of the whole uh, spine. We do standard uh, MRI of the brain because it is more sensitive than CT for the metastatic lesions of the brain, a bone scan and PET CT to evaluate the whole uh, skeleton. Laboratory investigations and tumor markers might give you an idea about the primary tumor and they are essential to detect other uh, uh, lesions. Uh, after then you can evaluate using these images, evaluate the stability of the spine lesion and then suggest uh, the primary tumor. If you can find a lesion in the lung or the kidney, you might think that the primary lesion is one of these organs. The presence of additional visceral and bony metastasis adversely affects the survival rate of these patients, which in turn may have an impact on the choice of, uh, of treatment. Uh, the well-known uh, Tomita scoring system depends on three uh, factors uh, which help to uh, make a decision. And we, uh, we mean the primary tumor, uh, visceral metastasis, and the extension of the bony metastasis. So we can generate a score which in turn determines the aggressiveness of treatment needed. The higher the score is, 
the worse the prognosis will be and the approach should be more conservative. Um, uh, Tokuhashi et al. have published a more sophisticated scoring system uh, taking six key prognostic factors in consideration. The general condition of the patient, number of extra spinal bony metastases, number of metastases in the spine, metastases to the major internal organs, uh, the site of the primary lesion, and the severity of the neurology. Patients with lower scores are recommended for more conservative approach, uh, with the higher scoring patients receiving excisional surgeons. So the surgical options um, available for treating uh, these patients uh, start from just a decompression and goes through go through to uh, in-block resection. Uh, kyphoplasty, minimal invasive fixation, uh, plus minus debulking of the uh, metastasis, open fixation with wide resection and corpectomy, uh, but it uh, has limited uh, criteria. So the literature proves that surgery followed by radiotherapy is usually superior to radiotherapy uh, alone. And this is a conflict with the radiotherapists and the oncologists who, uh, who are always going for a very conservative uh, treatment and they are uh, almost always against uh, surgery, uh, especially if we are uh, suggesting uh, a type of aggressive uh, surgery. So the minimal invasive surgery gives you a, a good argument against the colleagues of the oncology and the radiotherapy. And uh, these options should be discussed with the patient and he has to choose uh, the best way for his treatment together with the advice of our uh, uh, team. On the other hand, the prerequisites to perform an in-block resection are very rare, uh, rarely fulfilled. So now we will start with our, uh, our case presentation. The first uh, patient, uh, 67 years old female patient has a cancer breast for uh, five years and got uh, surgery. Uh, now she was presented with severe neck pain and there was no neurological symptoms. The CT showed this uh, uh, osteolytic lesion of the spine. And I believe this is a very good uh, uh, case just to go for one single level uh, corpectomy wide uh, resection and radiotherapy afterwards. Uh, the second case is a patient impending paraplegia, uh, bronchogenic carcinoma was known, bone destruction of L1, spinal canal stenosis, severe L1 and L2 radiculopathy. Uh, the patient was bedridden because of the pain and, uh, as said, impending paraplegia. The, the challenge was not only the size of the lesion, but also that the patient was a, a pacemaker carrier. Uh, so MRI was not uh, possible in uh, such a patient um, in an emergency department. And we went for uh, uh, microscopic assisted uh, wide resection and decompression debulking of the uh, lesion and uh, percutaneous uh, fixation uh, to get uh, enough stability. The patient was able to stand and walk uh, in short time after surgery. This patient was 52 years old. There, he has no history of known uh, tumors. He was presented with severe neck pain for months. The X-ray was done and showed um, massive bone destruction of uh, C3, C4, and part, uh, part of uh, C2. The CT shows the extension of the uh, bone destruction. So with the help of our uh, interventional radiology department, we go uh, 24 hours for surgery uh, for an embolization of the lesion to reduce the risk of the bleeding. And we went for, uh, this is, these are uh, his MRI images and uh, he has no neurology for uh, operation and uh, alhamdulillah also after the operation. So we went for a wide uh, resection of the lesion, but we started with a posterior fixation just to get a, a type of stability, uh, decompression of the cord uh, from posteriorly and went for anteriorly for um, uh, extensile or expandable cage. Uh, there was no chance to fix the cage in the uh, adjacent bony segments. So 
this type of cage is, is uh, 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 suitable for such wide resections and wide corpectomies depend on Dr. the stability. Hassan, yes? تقريبا السلايدز واقفة عندنا. ثانية واحدة. واقفة احنا احنا واحدة. عندنا اللي هي الانترا اوبرتيف مايكروسكوبيك دي بالكينج دي. ثانية واحدة كده. احنا شايفين دلوقتي سيرفيكال سباين I will go backwards this was the third case with the severe bony distraction of C2 C3 and part of C4 do you see the images now yes so the CT um, showed a massive bone distraction and high grade instability uh, the MRI images shows a ballooning of the uh, C3 C4 and part of C2, the patient had no neurology. As said, 24 hours for surgery, we go for uh, embolization of the lesion with the help of uh, interventional uh, radiology department. Uh, so we uh, can achieve um, uh, good uh, bony or uh, blood control before uh, surgery. One second. I believe you can see it now a little bit better. So we went for a posterior uh, fixation, decompression, laminectomy, and in the same session, anterior uh, wide resection of uh, the lesion, excisional biopsy, decompression of the spinal uh, cord, and um, the cage was uh, stable enough through a wide distraction and uh, uh, fixation at the end the plates and the above and um, lower uh, segments. Uh, this patient also with uh, bronchial carcinoma, massive bone destruction of uh, C2. The patient was uh, 78 years old. We went for a posterior fixation. Uh, this is the positioning intraoperatively. And uh, we went for except to cervical fusion because the stabilization of C1 was not satisfactory. And in such patients, you don't have always two chance, uh, chances to uh, have a good uh, fixation to avoid neurological deficits. Out afterwards, the patient was uh, mobile after surgery and the result was satisfactory. This patient, the last case, I believe uh, 52 years old, male patient, progressive uh, paraparesis. The lesion is, uh, was affecting mainly the fourth thoracic vertebra uh, mainly the posterior elements and the adjacent rep. The primary lesion was at this point was unknown. He was a, he has a very progressive neurology, so we don't had uh, we didn't have the option or the luxury to wait for a biopsy and then wait for the result of uh, the biopsy. We went immediately for preoperative embolization and uh, uh, wide resection decompression. Uh, debulking of the lesion with uh, posterior fixation. Uh, the pathology report was a follicular thyroid carcinoma. So he went for a thyroidectomy uh, 10 days after uh, our surgery. So the take home message can, can be that surgery followed by radiotherapy is superior to radiotherapy alone. Uh, on the other hand, you have to ask yourself if your patient, especially uh, uh, multi-morbidity patients and old uh, patients can survive a major surgery and ask yourself if you can uh, have a minimal invasive or a smaller option to treat him. Uh, the case should be discussed interdisciplinary in a tumor conference uh, with other uh, specialists. Uh, the decision should be uh, openly discussed with the patient and his family. Uh, three months of life expectancy is long enough to get the courage to perform surgery. And thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Hassan, for your presentation. May I ask you regarding the, what is the most common complication postoperatively that you face in your series? 
Uh, actually, if you, uh, you go for a minimal invasive uh, surgery, uh, the complications might be regarding uh, the implant. If the patient has a good survival rate and you do, you do just only a fixation without fusion. This is uh, 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 very common in patients with multiple myeloma, for, uh, for example, which be missed for an, a pathological fracture or an osteoporotic fracture. You take a biopsy and afterwards you find out that it is a, a plasmocytoma or a multiple myeloma with uh, a failure of the implant or uh, adjacent uh, segment fractures. In the open surgery, uh, the most common uh, problem is uh, the wound healing. If you have to go for a, a long segment fixation, a thorough uh, uh, laminectomy and uh, decompression, uh, these patients with uh, uh, weak immunity, they may suffer from uh, a catastrophic wound, uh, dehiscence and wound lesion. So, so you have to take care uh, of uh, the wound, especially in the first 15 days, and then uh, after he wound healing, uh, you can start with uh, oncological treatment, uh, radiotherapy, or otherwise any uh, adjuvant treatment. Okay, great. Any comments, questions? Okay, Hassan, thank you so much for thank the presentation. You, thank you. Inshallah, I'm going to go to Egypt, inshallah. Inshallah, I'm going to go to Egypt. I'm going to go to Egypt, inshallah. The endoscope on the next week is going to be in the Nile Badrawi. Yes, I'm going to go to Egypt, inshallah. I'm going to go to Egypt, inshallah. I'm going to go to Egypt, inshallah. Thank you, Mohamed. Thank you. 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 Thank you is a well-known uh, neurosurgeon and uh, craniosurgical master in the world. Please uh, start showing your screen. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Samai. Can you hear me, Samai? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. So you know what? Unfortunately, I have... Let me... I am not in my own town, I am outside, and I am not sure if my internet connection is good. There is something, my computer is stuck. Just a minute. There is some... Samai, hello. Yes, at all. Just put on, on, on screen mode. No, I cannot. You see, there is some... Uh, it's a stock. It you is can... stuck. Mm -hmm. Just I I share know. the screen and start again. That's what I did and it worked. No, this ring is coming. Sami, I think you get to the next speaker. In the meantime, I'll see if I can sort settle this. Okay, we will go for a physical lecture, then back to you. Thank you. Okay, 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 Sami. Uh, inshallah, now we'll start the physical part of our meeting. We have uh, distinguished speakers. We have Professor Muhammad Wafa, Professor of Orthopedics at Anshams University. Professor Wafa, I uh, will talk on pediatric spine tumors. Read to Dr. Muhammad.
Uh, excuse me, but I cannot hear anything from the talk of Dr. Muhammad, and the camera is not concentrated on uh, Dr. Muhammad. Of لا لا Uh, can we start? Right. Thanks to the organizers and thanks to the new technology that we can meet together here with speakers from India, from Canada, and uh, Italy, uh, Germany, um, 
and Portugal all together in this uh, in this hall. Uh, actually, my talk will not be very concentrated as the other talks. It will be a general talk about spinal tumors in children. Uh, uh, when you get when you get these uh, uh, kids with persistent back pain <coughs> Without a, history, with a, without a history of trauma, this is uncommon. And this should be taken uh, seriously and fully investigated. In children who seek medical attention, the incidence of organic causes for, for these symptoms is high. So we have to be very careful. 70% of primary tumors seen in children, in children are, uh, thanks God, benign. Uh, mainly 40% of these Compromised, uh, comprised of osteoid osteomas, osteoblastomas, osteochondromas, and aneurysmal bone cysts. A very small uh, group of pediatric spinal nucleus represent as primary malignant tumors. So uh, uh, oncologic staging for these cases, the benign or benign can be latent or active uh, uh, tumors, or maybe aggressive even benign tumors, but malignant ones could be classified into 1A, 1B, <coughs> low-grade uh, 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 tumors. Uh, uh, sometimes inside the A is inside the vertebral body and B invades the paravertebral compartments. High-grade malignancy are defined as 2A or 2B, and then 3 if you have distant metastases. The spine deformity may occur in pediatric spinal tumors. We know that pain can cause scoliosis, uh, irradiation or erosion of the, uh, of the vertebral bodies can result in, uh, in, uh, in, a, in a kyphotic deformity. Let's start with the osteochondromas. Osteochondromas are very common tumors. We see this in orthopedic practice very, very often. Spinal lesions are encountered only in seven to nine percent of patients with multiple uh, hereditary exostosis, and patients may have neurologic compromise if they have if they have invasion or infringement of oh, sure. spinal canal or nerve roots. Uh, osteochondromas presenting with spinal cord compression may be seen in 56% in the, in, the, in the cervical spine, 38% in thoracic, and rarely in, in the lumbar spine, 6%. And CT scan is the essential diagnostic tool to see the point of origin uh, for, of this uh, tumor. Then you can uh, decide and uh, uh, design your approach to take it out. You can see this in a, in a 17, 18 years old uh, lad presented with the progressive quadriparesis uh, due to lesion in the cervical spine. You can see this, uh, the, the osteochondroma, and the treatment here was very easy. I mean, you can see the MRI, you can see the uh, cord malacia uh, of the cervical cord, and then by uh, wide laminectomy, you can get a very good uh, result of uh, after decompression. The osteoid osteomas, benign lesions, affects the posterior elements mainly. And most patients between five and 25 years of old, uh, uh, males are more affected than females by maybe three times. And microscopically, it's a well circumscribed, randomly interconnected with trabecular moving bones that is uh, rimmed by osteoblasts outside, and then white uh, walled uh, capillaries. Uh, 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 dilated congested capillaries around the lesion. It's usually presented as persistent back pain most of the night, 
and improved by aspirin and other non steroidal anti anti-inflammatories. The painful scoliosis can be the presenting uh, uh, factor. In large reviews, 78% of patients with osteoma uh, and 54% of patients with uh, osteoblastomas present with scoliosis. So when you see pain and scoliosis, then put this in mind, it might be simpler than, than the real deformity, it could be just a, an osteoblastoma. The most sensitive method is the bone scan. When, to decide where is the lesion is by bone scan. Uh, uh, treatment is accompanied by resection of the nidus. When you remove the nidus, then everything will resolve. The pain and the deformity will, will be better. And percutaneous radio frequency can be used in safe parts of the spine. So don't be very close to the nerves, otherwise, it might be uh, harmful. And then, when it comes to the osteoblastoma, which is uh, 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 benign expanding osteotic lesion, comes in posterior elements also, 55% of the cases, and the extent of the vertebral body in 40%. Histologically, it's similar to the osteoblastoma, but has some differences. Uh, it's less common than the osteoblastoma, greater diameter, more than two centimeters in diameter less sclerotic and more expansive. Pain is much less proven that, uh, than that of the osteoblastoma, and it's not easily relieved by uh, aspirin, and maybe first put it as palpable mess. Resection of the vertebral osteoblastoma provided satisfactory uh, uh, results uh, with 10 to 20% of recurrence. Aggressive ones have a recurrence rate more than 50%. Well, if you can do a total on block, uh, rarely you need total on block spondylectomy for such cases. Let's look at this 17 years old, low back pain, male low back pain, radiculopathy, and right lower limb pain. And then this is the biopsy proof to have an osteoblastoma, <coughs> as you can see it here. The CT scan may be uh, uh, giving us better pictures. So what do you think? What can we do with this? Block resection? Oh, we can do decompression intra-lesion uh, curettage. Yeah? But here, because of the affection of the facet joints, you, you, should, uh, you should add fixation to this. Uh, uh, and this is what we did. And this is the follow-up after one year. You can see good uh, posterior lateral fusion on that on the right side. But you need to do very good decompression, very good exposure and curettage. Look at this. This is another 15 years old lad who, who presented with a recurrence of, of a, a osteoblastoma. Uh, and I know that it has been done with minimally invasive resection. Just a little incision, microscope, curettage as much as it could, and then no more, nothing, I mean, no fixation, no uh, 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 drilling or uh, high speed bed usage in the, in the walls of the, of the lesion. And then it recaired, and he's now scheduled for uh, another uh, surgery with uh, uh, this is the new MRI, you can see the recurrence, it's a really big one. And he is scheduled for wider resection and for fixation. Let's go to the aneurysmal bone cysts. It's much more common than the other lesions. It uh, represents about 15% for all 15% of all primary spine tumors. Massive bone destruction, uh, span side lesion. Uh, uh, it's more common in female. Most ABCs are reported to occur during the first and second decade, rarely after the age of 30. Malignant transformation is rare, and it's related to the uh, irradiation, actually. Uh, a combined and anterior and posterior approach is the type of surgery usually needed in these cases, but you have to have selected preoperative embolization. And we heard from our first speaker then that repeated 
preoperative embolization could be a treatment and selective injection of, of uh, uh, stem cells uh, and, and denosumab is, is, uh, is in use now. But I, the cases I'm going to show you are all more than 20 years old case, 20, more than 20 years uh, done, I mean, before. Look at this. This is 10 years old boy, pain at the cervical, uh, cervical thoracic junction, progressive weakness of upper motor neuron type. Here, yeah, this big uh, lesion at T2 body and extending posterior, as you can see. So he was seen by one of our senior neurosurgeons at that time, and he, he did a twice uh, laminectomy to improve his uh, uh, neurological condition. And the pathology came up with aneurysm and bronchitis. And it's extended also by time to D2 with good collapse of, of T1, and still the, the, the vacuums in the big lesion of the posterior part of the spine. And uh, of course, you can hardly see the spinal cord in these uh, sections. That's the CT scan, you can see the vacuums. And extending to T2. So what would you do? Had the Embolization, of course, down the course of, I mean, to, to, to decrease the blood loss. The patient is uh, getting, going to be paraplegic. Uh -huh. And the D2. D1, D2. Yes, of course. This is the way anterior and posterior. But we started posterior by uh, plating. And this one of the very early cases, or the very few cases we needed, sternotomy to get to these lesions. I'll show you this. Uh, <clears throat> posterior stabilization fusion, followed by a tube compactomy, tube compression, and reconstruction. Do you remember these plates? Not that I have a batch match. And then after the stabilization, we added the sternotomy, corpectomy, the big graft, you can see it here, and plating, and tear plates. And this kid now is more than 20 years uh, post-operatively, and he's doing very well. You can see the uh, CT scan post-operatively, and this is after six months with good anterior fusion. And you cannot see any more in the CT scan of the previous lesion. So you were very lucky actually with this kid. <coughs> Again, 16 years old, uh, a lesion in the uh, ala of the sacrum, as you can see here, presented with pain and uh, uh, some neurological, uh, I mean, it's, uh, uh, some radicular pain like a sciatic radiation. And you can see this is the CT scan, the MRI. So, what do you think? Nowadays, I will do implantation. Repeat it. Ah, we'll see. 20 years ago, we'll go for the operation. Interlesion and clavitation. I'm not sure what I'm saying. I think it's in 2005. Anyway. Yes. But actually, he was seen by one, by one of the intervention radiologists. And he decided to do to do local injection of concentrated alcohol. And he did not notice that there is a connection between the lesion and the spinal canal. So what happened actually is that the patient had this in the early evening, and then it developed uh, paraplegia and uh, stool and urine incontinence. So he was referred to uh, to Rangers, to, to our uh, hospital, and we had this MRI. 
Can you see something here in the distant part of the, of the spinal canal? Can you see some uh, compression of the neural elements? From posterior. From posterior. Yes. From posterior. From posterior. Yes. From posterior. Yes. We had no experience actually with these cases. What would you do with this? Uh, uh, such a case. So you can see here I, actually in the, in the uh, cross section uh, that it's, uh, it's badly uh, compressed. So what, what I did actually is I did three levels demonstration, decompression, and I found that the, the, the epidural fat was like a mud. It's a necrotic black uh, tissues around the, the dura, and then repeated wash with, uh, with normal saline. And that's what we did. Uh, nothing else we could do actually. So, uh, uh, but we succeeded to get this, uh, uh, I mean, recovery of his neurological condition over uh, five, six months. Gradually started to be able to walk and then uh, uh, controlling his sphincters gradually. Uh, and this is almost 17 years now, uh, postoperatively. And this is CT scan I got after two years. You can see the uh, yeah. injection, and it's really connected to the canal. Huh? Yeah. 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 And, uh, and, uh, and wash. Let's go to the hemangioma. You get these cases uh, at the end of your clinic with a, with a, with a family coming saying that uh, we have our uh, daughter or our son is having this bad tumor in his spine. According to the report of the a radiographer or the uh, and they are worried and then you look at the x-rays and you look at the CT or the MRI and you find nothing but the human genome yeah? with this typical appearance so this is nothing this just to, to, to follow up to, to uh, you need just family reassurance and patient reassurance and follow up very rarely that this would, would go for, uh, I mean, to be active uh, lesions maybe in the, in the coming years. But uh, I think the number of hemangiomas in the spine we see in the MRIs are huge. So, uh, it's nothing. But look at this. This lady is 22 years old. She came after four years of an attack of paraplegia during her last few days of pregnancy. So she was pregnant. She's going to deliver within a few days. And then suddenly she developed uh, 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 paraplegia. So she had, she had a, a, a cesarean section in the morning and in the evening she had uh, transferred from the uh, maternity department to the neurosurgery department where she had a wide laminectomy and they preserved her uh, spinal cord. And now she's coming because of the collapse, pain, and okay, kyphotic deformity. So what we did actually is that we, uh, uh, she had a very good fusion actually posterolaterally, but I don't have the pictures. Uh, we did an osteotomy and correction of her deformity to be followed later on by resection of the uh, corpectomy, I mean, uh, and grafting. And the diagnosis came as intraosseous hemangioma. This is very old uh, note also. Isinophilic granuloma, what we call the vertebra plana. You get this uh, kid, five, six, eight years old with back pain, and then you get this X-ray, you get the collapse of one of the vertebra, uh, you take a biopsy, you take, uh, and, and then it proved to be isinophilic granuloma. Uh, what would you do with this? Conservative treatment. 
but yes, we just conserve, we give them uh, painkillers, maybe support and sometimes, but very rarely they come and persist that the pain is, is severe and the deformity is progressive. So uh, very rarely I face these cases, look at this, mid, uh, I mean, low, lower dorsal, maybe D9 or D10, with progressive kyphosis and pain. Six months following up in the clinic with pain, pain. So actually I decided to fuse uh, this lesion. You can see even during uh, prone position, there's no correction of the, of the deformity, which is getting better by, uh, by the uh, uh, little osteotomy, little V-shaped osteotomy and, and fusion. This is very rarely needed, actually. It's not uh, the common one. Osteosarcoma, thanks God, it's very rare in the spine. Maybe three or five percent of all osteosarcomas come to the spine. The most effective surgical intervention here is the unblock resection. If you know that this is an osteosarcoma and you have a chance to do unblock resection, then this is the treatment. But we, we use the usual protocol of orthopedic surgery is that we give maybe three doses of uh, preoperative uh, chemotherapy, and then we go for the resection. It would be easier, less blood loss, less bleeding, and clear pictures when you get the resection, and then you do combined anterior and posterior uh, uh, fusion. Even sarcoma, most commonly it's in other parts of the body, and secondly is, is in, in the spine. Metastatic foci of even sarcoma involved in the spine are more common than primary ones coming to the spine or starting in the spine, mostly in the sacrococcygeal areas. And the main concern or the main uh, 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 point of, of prognosis is that the response to uh, uh, chemotherapy. If they are responding well to chemotherapy, then they will survive uh, this problem. Lymphomas, primary lymphomas have has better prognosis than secondary ones. Surgery is for biopsy, cord decompression, and stabilization when needed. Radiation therapy with or without chemotherapy is very good usually in getting rid of these uh, uh, lymphomas. But sometimes, like in this case, you can see a big lesion here, and then compressing the spinal cord and uh, presenting with, with, uh, with uh, paraplegia or paraparesis. She was seen by one of uh, senior colleagues, and this also maybe 18 years ago. She had, a, what, she had a wide decompression to save the cord, but see what happened? Severe deformity and uh, uh, like a, like a spondylolisthesis of D2 over D3, as you can see here, with marked stretching of the cord and recurrence of the, of the weakness. <clears throat> so as an orthopedic surgeon, I thought that traction could be useful, but of course it was not. And another case of sternotomy, we needed to do sternotomy, as you can see here, grafting after resection of the affected bodies and anterior plating, which was hardly, hardly uh, holding because of the severely osteoporotic vertebrae above and below. And then again, the the very old plates with lateral mass screws, pedicle screws down there in the dorsal spine. And she had the, the, to continue the chemo and radiotherapy according to the uh, instructions of our oncologists. And you can see the x-rays or the CT scan showing the, and this is uh, after a long time, long follow-up, you can see the incorporation of the anterior graft uh, very well. And here's the picture. You can see the deformity and then the nice looking uh, neck after that. Leukemias in 6% of children with leukemia, back pain and vertebral uh, collapse uh, is the presentation. During the course of the disease, 10% will sustain a pathological vertebral fracture, sometimes involving multiple levels. And you can see that usually there are multiple levels affected severely osteoporotic and collapses. And this is one of the typical x-rays of leukemias. 
Uh, bone scan uh, is, uh, is unreliable. Sometimes it's a negative bone scan, despite all these uh, uh, changes. Very rarely we get metastatic diseases from neuroblastomas or embryonic carcinomas in the spine, in the uh, premature uh, spine. So, and the poor prognosis are most treated non-operatively. It's not usually, we don't have the chance. We don't get the chance to treat them surgically, actually. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Dr. Wafa, for your presentation. Questions, comments? I, I have a question. Dr. Dr. Wafa, we, we used uh, uh, in the past during my residency, when we see aneurysmal bone cysts and our senior uh, staff was doing the procedure for uh, depulking intralegional curettage, we, uh, I, I can remember quite of uh, cases that present later with aggressive aneurysmal bone cysts. D do you remember one of cases like this, or do you saw cases like this? You have seen the in the first case, I mean, uh, twice laminectomy and curettage uh, 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 with no good uh, response. I mean, recurrence is more aggressive. And I think we had to be more ag surgically aggressive to get rid of the, of the tumor. Uh, uh, sometimes you, 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 the, it's in orthopedic surgery, you use phenol and you use uh, uh, high-speed uh, bears and... Uh, but it's not always feasible in the spine. It's not easy to put phenol on the, I mean, I don't know if you can put phenol on the spinal cord or not, but. Uh, uh, we, 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 we put phenol sometimes in case of uh, uh, cordomas in the sacrum, intralegional curettage and uh, apply phenol. It is uh, recorded, recorded in the literature, so we can use it, but you need to irrigate uh, rapidly with saline because of uh, the toxicity from absorption of the phenol to other systems like the lung or something like this. Right. It's devastating. Mm -hmm. But with irrigation, is okay. Uh, uh, I, I have a question uh, Hassan? from Muhammad Hassan Salheen. A question from Dr. Hassan Salheen. I, uh, I have a question regarding the approach of the Hassan. upper thoracic lesion. Do you, under, do you hear me? Do you hear me, Dr. Muhammad? Dr. Muhammad, do you hear me? Do you hear me? Do you hear me? Dr. Muhammad, I'm going to give a presentation. For osteodosteoma, after treatment, either surgical section or percutaneous surgical frequency ablation, as a deformity is a result of due to due due to being, does it need any intervention for correction of this deformity? For the cases we have seen, it just whenever you just take the the osteodosteoma out and you are sure that this piece of bone you removed is the osteodosteoma, then they they improve. Uh, gradually the pain disappears and the deformity. I don't know if it's a long-standing deformity. Would it disappear or not? But usually, uh, uh, yes, the deformity disappears. Dr. Muhammad, I have a question regarding the approach for the upper thoracic lesions. Uh, you have chosen uh, twice to, get, to go for uh, sternotomy for T1, T2, or T3 uh, corpectomy, grafting and plating. Uh, what about the cost of transversectomy or attacking such lesions, uh, transmedicular approach or a cost of transversectomy approach? Uh, what are the, the, the difficulties? Um, so you had decided to go for a, a more difficult approach which is the sternotomy. Yes, uh, the, actually the rationale was that if you would like to put a plate reaching down to D4 
then uh, this is the, the direct way, a sternotomy with the help of cardiac surgeons, and then remove the, 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 the prepare actually the, the, the way to you. Then you, you just get the, the curettage, the resection of the tumor, the, the decompression, and then you can put your plate safely uh, and, and, and fixation. Uh, uh, I would say that costal transversectomy will be an awkward way to go to the anterior surface of the spine and you put your plates. The vessels, the big vessels will be, uh, yes, of course. It will not be very clear. Uh, what, what do you think, uh, Professor uh, Wafa, about using expandable cages just from a uh, 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 posterolateral approach? They are inserted just very small and you can uh, extend the cages inside the lesion and then apply the posterior fixation. Uh, or you can apply the fixation for one side, go from the other side for costal transversectomy, and then apply the fixation. I mean, this, this was, was maybe uh, obligatory to go in, uh, through sternotomy because you, you had only grafting and plates. Do I understand it correctly? I, I, I will form the question in another way. Would you go today for a costal transversectomy with an extensa expandable cage, or would you uh, uh, repeat the same decision and go from anterior for, uh, through a sternotomy? Uh, with costal transversectomy, it's never clear for me the the complete resection of the of the tumor tissues, especially on the other side. Yeah. Uh, 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 maybe I was young and was yeah. more uh, <laughs> enthusiastic. I can do yeah. things like this in, in maybe 20, 22 years ago. Uh, maybe now I would think in your uh, in your option. May I comment, Professor Wafa, regarding, regarding uh, what Hassan saying? I think it is very challenging to approach D1, D2 from posterior because of the nerves. The nerves at uh, these levels uh, share in the brachial plexus, and it's an insult will cause devastating complication of the patient. I, that's, that's I believe it is, it is much safer to approach it from anterior as Professor Wafa did. It is, it is completely different when you approach BGK, for example, in degenerative cases. You can go transpedicular and don't dissect that much laterally, so you can correct the sagittal profile. But in tumor cases, I believe you need to go anterior and posterior. I, I'm not sure, I'm not familiar with such difficult uh, cases, but this is my uh, expectations. But this is the rationale of this discussion, just to have a brainstorming of the difficulties of each approach. I believe you can avoid the injury of the of the roots. We do costal transversectomy for lower levels like T4, T5 yes. without any danger of the, of the roots. But you have a right. You are concerned about the injury of the, of the nerve roots. Of course, you can avoid it, but it is very manipulative and very dangerous. But I believe that could be uh, 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 not that dangerous, like the dissection of the arch of the aorta. Of, of course, Dr. Rwafa has his team, and the cardiac surgeons are uh, making the access and the approach. But this is the rationale of, of this uh, discussion, and uh, I have learned from it. Thank you, Dr. Rwafa. Thank you, Dr. Yes, you have pros and cons in every, uh, in every way. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so well. much, Dr. Rwafa. Shukran. So, so may may uh, at all quill is ready or uh, halas cancelled? Anjouf, okay. So we'll continue our physical meeting. Now I'm happy to invite Professor Dr. Muhammad Sirri, uh, Professor of Orthopedics at Al Mansoura University. Uh, Professor Sirri will uh, give us some uh, tumor case uh, presentation. Dr. Muhammad.
لو حد معاه انترستنج كيس فور ديسكشن ويحب يعرضها نتكلم مع بعض فيها مور ذان ويلكم يعني لو معاك بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم دي هتبقى حلقة يعني كيس ديسكشن مع انتراكت سيشن كيس 1 Uh, immune compromised infant, uh, two years old, presented by progressive barbaresis, uh, severe pneumonia with multiple skin uh, lesions. Um, uh, Blenix and MRI show progressive severe destruction and replacement by soft tissue mass, very and interspinally, uh, affecting about five thoracic vertebrae. Uh, Blenix chest revealed severe pneumonia. What is the most probable diagnosis? The two years old? Two, two years, yes. What? Spondylodiscitis? Infection? Uh, what type? Well, yes. Biogenic. Biogenic, yes. Uh, immune compromised infant. Mm. Uh, there's progressive destruction of Yeah, maybe two weeks or up to complete disappearance of uh, this vertebra. Uh, MRI show interspinal and paraspinal uh, soft tissue mass. Management, what to do? Mean the LTB here? Why do you want to say that it's LTB? شايف في كومبليت ديستراكشن فيرتيبرال بودي انت ايه بيعمل كومبليت ديستراكشن فيرتيبرال بودي في كوليكشن ومور ذان وان فيرتيبرا هي سوفت تيشو مش كوليكشن سوفت تيشو ميس يس يعني هو تي بي اس كرونيك السبونديلو ديسكايتس از ماتش كومن وماتش اكيوت برزنتيشن ودي ماشي اكتر مع الديسك انتاكت هنا الديسكات كلها سبونديلايتس يا محمد مع ال يعني هو عنده نيومونيا وممكن يبقى فيه انفكشن وعندنا yes. anterior و posterior collection as well what to do uh, do you recommend the biopsy the compression you, you, uh, you said I, the patient is paraparatic right no uh, we did percutaneous biopsy uh, two times reveal aspergillosis fungal infection fungal infection تريتمنت انتي فانجل اند اميون سب الطفل ده كان عنده اميون سب بتاع ده كان اميون كومبرومايز عنده فاجوسيتيك ديسفانكشن بتوع البيدياتريك كانوا بيعالجوه على كده تعمل له ديكومبريشن و انترنال ستابيلايزيشن بس انفورشنتلي ذا تشايلد دايد افتر 1 مانث Because uh, cardiothoracic surgeon refused to do uh, operation for him for the lung and the, the blood effusion. But, but the, the, the main problem with the fungal infection is that infection it, bleeds, in, it bleeds a lot. In immune, intraoperative. In, in immune compromised child. Mm. Mm. Of course, okay. it is devastating yes. comorbidity. But regarding the intraoperative bleeding, Is it was okay? Okay, yes. No, no, no problem that, with the bleeding. The tumor, the soft tissue mass was easily removed. The uh, fixation above and below, uh, just as a splinting. And what? And the biopsy also the uh, uh, fungal infection, aspergillosis. Two, the two open year, biopsy. Two year, two years old. The child mm. is it was easy to apply uh, the particular screws yes. up and down. Yes. Okay. Okay. سسبكت سسبكت ان ممكن يبقى عندك يعني انا قلت فور 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 ذا فيرست تشانس اي ويل ديكومبريس طب هو قال لك لا خد بايوبسي وطلعت فانجل انفكشن بريبيرد نو يور انمي بيفور انترفينشن سكند كيس 9 ييرز اولد تشايلد بريزنتد باي انفلتريتيف ليجن افكتنج ال 4 فيرتيبا بيركوتينيوس بايوبسي Uh, osteomyelitis. The patient treated by antibiotic with no response. Repeated the biopsy two times, and in every time uh, it is osteomyelitis. Okay. Failed the treatment for nine months. When we saw the patient, 
We did, we repeated the imaging. Okay. That show progression with appearance of soft tissue mass on the under surface of the lamina. Management. We did open biopsy after nine months and revealed Ewing sarcoma. Infection and the uh, Ewing. <laughs> Treatment. Chemotherapy. Do you recommend surgery? Anyone recommend surgery? The primary treatment of Ewing is radio and the chemotherapy. It is radio and the chemosensitive. Uh, also, in this extensive lesion, what, uh, how to do reconstruction in this five level affection. So, we did the radio therapy and the chemotherapy with good response, and the patient uh, uh, 15 years oh. now. No, no recurrence. Okay. That's my initial name. Vertebra blana. Differential diagnosis of vertebra blana. blana. Uh, xenophilic granuloma, infection, or sarcoma. Okay. This patient with xenophilic granuloma uh, and interspinal extension. The patient was referred by a medical oncologist who was treating the, the child by chemotherapy. Uh, with no response. Treatment, surgical excision, reconstruction, the correction of deformity. Another case of vertebra blana, uh, this uh, shows the importance of biopsy in these cases. Because uh, not all cases of xenophilic granuloma are surgically treated, so you have to know the pathology by doing percutaneous biopsy. Also, some cases may be infection, like this case. This case with destruction of the vertebral body with bar spinal extension. Biopsy was done, infection. Medical treatment followed by, and this is, okay. After uh, medical treatment, but with deformity, treated by uh, correction and stabilization and fixation. Case five also, the same vertebra blana, infection by biopsy. This will show you the, the importance of doing percutaneous biopsy. Okay. Biopsy, many indications for doing a biopsy. Uh, one of them is to exclude malignancy in cases of intractable discitis in children, like the case of Ewing sarcoma. Uh, spinal biopsy may be a guided biopsy or open biopsy. The guided percutaneous uh, guided biopsy, whether fluoroscopic or CT, is safe, less effective, cost effective, uh, with lower complication rate. But the accuracy of percutaneous biopsy range from 40 up to 90%. So it may lead to results in only 40% of patients. This depends on the location and type of the lesion, approach, type of the needle used, and imaging used. Being highly uh, sensitive for, in case for malignant than benign lesions, uh, more diagnostic yield in uh, lytic than sclerotic and cystic lesions, and very soft lesions. How to improve uh, sample adequacy by using OR navigation, directing the, your needle or forceps in different directions, or addition and addition of pituitary forceps, forceps, forceps to have uh, multiple uh, samples from the affected uh, vertebra. Also, some use interoperative cytology. Uh, to, uh, to know if uh, the, the sample uh, contain tumor tissue or not. Open biopsy is the gold standard, having accuracy up to 98% of cases. Does spinal biopsy necessary for all pediatric tumors? Uh, no. Sometimes you don't uh, need to uh, do uh, biopsy, as in case of progressive neurological deterioration in a solitary lesion, or evident pathology by imaging, like this case. 
this case of bow grace of bar braces with vertebral planar treated by immediate decompression and uh, reconstruction. The, the decompression and it was done by uh, unilateral postulateral approach, post on the vasectum in one side and the other side, uh, transvertebral uh, approach with complete excision of the affected body, putting a rib graft. This is a rib, of course, transvasectum and defixation. And the biopsy show xenophilic granuloma. Some cases, in, in case of osteoma, it is unnecessary to do biopsy, like this case with the nidus treated by excision without fixation. This is osteoblastoma treated by uh, fixation and, and uh, excision and fixation. This child with uh, osteod osteoma also affecting the lamina. MRI show edema on the surrounding muscles. So we suspect malignancy. Uh, and because it, it, it is a sclerotic lesion, the, the percutaneous biopsy will be difficult. So decided to do a, a excision, and this is the interoperative photo of the case and the fixation of fusion. And the biopsy was osteoma also. In ABC, this case of solid aneurysmal bone cyst, usually aneurysmal bone cyst affects the posterior elements. So in this case, you have to do biopsy. As uh, nowadays, uh, uh, not all cases of uh, aneurysmal bone cyst are uh, surgically treated. This patient with uh, aneurysmal bone cyst affecting the body, which occur in about 6 to 70% of patients, treated by uh, curatage and iliac with uh, local adjuvant therapy in, uh, using uh, the phenol. Uh, 90% and uh, alcohol 100% as, uh, as local adjuvant. But so the anterior approach, putting a graft without fixation. And this is the final follow-up to avoid uh, fixation uh, in the lumbar spine uh, with loss of two mobile segments. Another case of uh, aneurysmal bone cyst, I, I think is a, the pathology is evident. Do you recommend the biopsy in this case? Cystic uh, case? Yes, biopsy is important to know your enemy before intervention. Even if the, the, the imaging provide you about uh, the pathology? I, I have a patient with osteoplastoma and aneurysmal changes, so you cannot. Uh... No, our aneurysmal bone cyst may be associated with other pathologies like osteoplastoma, condoblastoma, uh, condomyxoid fibroma. Uh, fibers dysplasia. This is second day aneurysmal association. It may, it may be in the French and with transjectetic osteosarcoma. Uh, yes, in some case of aneurysmal uh, may be associated with transjectetic, especially in the long bones. Yes, yes. Transjectetic osteosarcoma in long bones. Okay. This case of aneurysmal bone cyst of D3 treated by one of our colleagues by short fixation, one score above and one below with incomplete resection, uh, ended by uh, deformity, uh, kyphosis at the upper thoracic area treated by, uh, like Dr. Mohammed Fawzi said, the postulateral excision and the cervicothoracic fixation. Some cases, uh, other tumor like conditions. Doctor, sorry, the cat level camp? Detailed. Detailed. Mm -hmm. uh, tumor like conditions may occur in blood diseases. This known case of thalassemia major patient, 18 years old, presented by progressive barbaricis with failed medical treatment till the patient become bedridden. What is the most probable diagnosis? In thalassemia. Infection. Hmm? Infection. Other possible other diagnosis. Hmm? Is there any relationship with thalassemia? Necrosis. Hmm? Necrosis. 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 Necros
وايه اللي في الاندر سيرفس اوف ذا لامينا ده الحاجات دي 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 ماي بي هيماتوما وات هيماتوما مي بي يس ليدنج دو يو كومنت بايوبسي ان ذيس كيس سينك نو I will give. I will go for definite treatment and intraoperative excisional biopsy. Yes. Uh, because of the the pathology uh, related to the 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 thalassemia, well, this what's called extramedulla hematopoiesis. And we did decompression, extensive decompression, laminectomy, uh, and long fixation. This is the uh, intraoperatively there was uh, severe bleeding. Uh, immediate post-operative, the patient uh, has uh, early post-operative infection to, and fever, high fever, uh, treated by uh, immune therapy, في immunoglobulins can be patient with uh, debridement will resolve it. Okay. One year later, developed the traumatic fracture at L2, treated by extension of fixation. One year later, developed subacondylar fracture. Okay. Spinal infection is the most common differential diagnosis of uh, tumors, of pediatric tumors. Usually, it, uh, uh, it differs from the adult spondylodiscitis, uh, is that it is central because uh, a spinal infection in children usually comes central. Infection may be paradiscal, like this case. Or affect the posterior elements, like this case, the pathology also was infection. But the commonest is the central type. Central type affecting the, the vertebra, like the first case of Ewing sarcoma. I will present you uh, twin cases of uh, spinal infection uh, treated, uh, was suggested to be a tumor. This twin patient. Uh, presented at the age of 3.5 year by failure to thrive with toxic manifestations, elevated ASR, white blood cell count, and the platelet with severe anemia. There's bog first twin, progressive vertebral body distraction, till it reaches to this picture, complete loss of the vertebral body due to affection of the gross plate of the affected body. Only the posterior elements are uh, remaining. And they was diagnosed at this stage as, and treated as congenital scoliosis, myopathy, neuropathy, and the second between the same picture, multiple affection with destruction of the body involving anterior and disabetical with paraspinal soft tissue extension. What to do? Yeah, so what's the most possible diagnosis? Infection. Infection. The, the, the hmm. Vertebra plana. Yeah, but here infection. Uh, multiple affection. Any one can give multiple. Hmm? What? Multiple is only again. The mac TB be multiple. What? Will infection be multiple? Biopsy can TB. Uh, Treatment had antitubercular drugs till consolidation. Uh, level the second twin can complete disappearance in the affected body due to affection of the gross plate. And this uh, L5 uh, show remodeling, good remodeling of the body. And we treated correction uh, by correcting the deformity in the first and second twin. The, the first treated by anterior construction with correction. The yani, follow up by the Hawali Hamas Sininia. With that second twin. Only excision of the posterior elements for combustion posterior. After about five to six years, one of them developed the upper deep cervical lymphadenopathy. We take a biopsy, we can it negative. With that, take TB, it has multiple affection. The multiple vertebral levels usually comes central 
relatively malignant with lower incidence of paraplegia, uh, end by significant angular collapse, which is severe and progressive due to affection of the growth plate, may be associated with restrictive lung disease. To take home message, spinal mal biopsy uh, is indicated in most of cases to know the pathology and the plan your treatment. Uh, open, bio uh, open biopsy is the gold standard, but percutaneous biopsy should be the first option and should be repeated if it is unrepresentative before doing open biopsy. If it is uh, negative, you should do revise the imaging, do repeated imaging and uh, revise yourself. And then uh, if it is failed, you, you go to uh, open biopsy. Granuloma spinal infection is the commonest differential diagnosis of spinal tumor. Thank you. So, shukran Gazilan, Dr. Muhammad, very nice uh, illustrative presentation. Uh, from your experience, you, you did a lot of surgery in pediatric cases. What is the tips and the tricks while putting the screws in 2.5, uh, three years old kids? Manipulation, يعني movement, small movement to your hand uh, to take the easiest bus of the medical. Uh, it, it is easy. To... This means you, you choose your trajectory like adult, the mammalian process, the same, for example, uh, the same marks, trajectory, but uh, يعني, slowly, slowly introducing motion. your uh, and gear shift. Regarding or... the brushes. Uh, yes. Uh, uh, here you have multiple affection, long segment fixation. Uh, so it is uh, at the end it is stable, and also the child is small and it doesn't require very strong fixation. No? Do you use to augment your uh, construct with braces or something like this? Yes, but in this braces? child, the uh, curb can be very difficult um, or a bit hidden. Can she make braces? Yeah. But uh, the fixation about five or four levels above and below was sufficient. MashaAllah, challenging cases. Uh, I comment, Asila, Dr. Muhammad. How do you comment? Shukran Gazilan, Dr. Seri, Shukran Gazilan. Will be Dr. Haysam Khira, Dr. Haysam, a spine consultant. Uh, في التأمين الصحي وفي جامعة القاهرة. I some got training with uh, Khaled Kibish and uh, his main interest was spine tumors. يعني we are happy to have uh, I some with us. I some it will be case presentation ولا تقولي؟ Assalamu alaikum. Shukran, Dr. Khattab, for your invitation. Will case D at application of the Kalam Likambi Alf Mohadar Al Ula will Musual Dr. Khattab, Dr. Wafa. This is a 31 year old female coming presenting to me with severe mid back pain and lower limb weakness. She had two previous operations for recurrent ABC of D12, D11. Uh, by examination, there is a local tenderness on deep palpation and superficial percussion. She cannot walk without assistance, and she had uh, right-sided weakness. This is the imaging studies. Dr. Khattab, what, okay. uh, what will you do? A recurrent? A recurrent aneurysm process. Huh? Aye, aggressive. Impolization. Uh, Non-urology. No neurology. No, fee neurology. Fee neurology. Oh, the right sided weakness. Right sided weak weakness, you will go again, pre operative implantation, and then go again for uh, interreligional curatage and decompression and assess your fixation anchorage point up and below if you need to increase uh, the anchorage point. But this I will, once there is neurology, I will intervene. If no neurology, I will do implantation. Implantation. Uh, this was the plan. Uh, العينة راحت ال uh, intervention radiologist unit وعملت embolization ترى artery of Adam Kovic at the level of the lesion. Uh, 
he refused to do embolization, uh, what you will do? I will go either for a costal transversectomy, uh, excision of the lesion, or combined posterior decompression, and then uh, mini thoracotomy, uh, corpectomy, and uh, implantation of an expandable cage. Um, this is a plan, uh, but I decided to do uh, a less morbid operation for the patient. Uh, while the patient uh, in uh, the intervention radiology unit, we did a percutaneous intralesional injection for the body lesion. Then we take the patient to the operating theater and do uh, the rest of the procedure. And this is how we did the procedure, exposure of the lesion and the previous implants, removal of the rod on the right side, the affected side, and do our decompression, and then follow the patient. During the post-operative stay, the patient regained her motor power, and uh, at day five, she can walk without assistance. And the permanent pathological sections confirm the diagnosis of ABC solid variant. This is the follow-up for the patients. Over 36 months. And here is the progressive sclerosis of the lesion. And there is no recurrence in the form of a new lesions or increase in size of the lesions. And the patient doing well uh, for seven years up to now. Thank you. Shukran, Gazir Haysam. what you, you inject the, the body, uh, inject B? Uh, actually, هو, inject B, the material D, it's not FDA approved. Uh, actually, we have the plan that we do injection to, in, to decrease the intraoperative blood loss. Blood loss. بعدين وانا بعمل كيوتاج لقيت ال 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 injected material بقت زي بون واكس ف فقلت هفولو هي بي إن بيوتايل سيانو كريليت اللي بيدول هي بتستخدم بس مش إف دي إيه أبروفت so it's application inside the vertebral body shows that it is uh, doing something. Huh? Oh, this is optical. Hmm. Replace the bone? Replace the bone. Oh. Follow up. During the follow-up, as you can see in CT, the calcification. The calcification yeah. progressive sclerosis of the lesion until it is completely hmm. ossified. هي 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 مش ابروفد في امريكا بس هي ابروفد في اليورو بيشتغلوا بيها في ايه هيسا؟ سكليرو ثيرابي سكليرو ثيرابي سكليرو ثيرابي اتس سكليرو ثيرابي ماتيريال بس مش اف دي اي ابروفد تمام ديد يو ديد يو بوت ذا بيشنت اون دينس يو ماب بوست اوبرتيف اور سمثينج لايك ذيس خالص 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 شي از دوينج فيري ويل تمام لا حاله ظريفه و less morbid operation. أنا بس هي أنا بحاول أدسكس أو بشير ال information نحنا in selected patients اللي هي ال ال recurrent ABCL aggressive. We can combine the حاجة minimally invasive مع the procedure لو العيانة neurologically involved. بصراحة لأن يرزم ال point system بذات aggressive وبيرجع تاني ساعات بي الواحد بيجيله أو رم لهش حل يعني. أيه. فالفكره بتاعت ان انت تنجكت الماده دي فيها ممكن تبقى حاجه بالظبط يعني اه يعني كود تشينج ذا جيم يعني بالظبط تمام خلاص كده ذاتس ات ذاتس ات شكرا جزيلا يا هيثم شكرا جزيلا دكتور محمد نجم في دكتور نجم هتعرض الحاله مش عاوز تنزل ليه؟ ننزل
انت انت خلاص خلصت طب لو دكتور هيثم عنده توك كده 10 minutes هتبقى ريفيجن لكل السباين تيومرز اعتقد يبقى ده ذا بيست سم اب لليوم النهارده ان شاء الله هو النهارده اليوم بصراحه تعاون ما بين الاي او سباين والورلد فيدريشن اوف نيورو سيرجري دكتور سامح كو تشيرمان للاديوكيشنال كوميتي كان هو اللي دعا لنا الانترناشونال جيست من اول اليساندرو جاسبريني واوسكار الفيس ودكتور حسن صالحين ومايكل فيلينج واحنا مزد اتول جويل وكان في دكتور جوكسلين بس هو اعتذر ان هو يبقى معانا لايف و سامح بتاعها موجود ان شاء الله هنبقى هستاذن ان احنا نابلود ليها على الاي دبليو ان شاء الله وبنشكر طبعا دكتور محمد وفا على حضوره والمحاضره الشيقه ودكتور سري ودكتور هيثم وهيثم هتقول لنا بقى ان شاء الله ايه السامري بتاع الانكو سباين ودي تبقى حاجه ظريفه بعد كده ان شاء الله نتعشى ونشوفكم في اذر اكتيفيتيز ان شاء الله بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم هي السباينال تيومرز انا بس عشان الناس اللي داخلين امتحان والناس اللي جايه تستفيد السباينال تيومرز ممكن تبقى بيناين وممكن تبقى ماليجننت والماليجننت ممكن ممكن تبقى برايمر وممكن تبقى ماليجننت احنا هنراجع كده بسرعه مع بعض البيناين تيومرز بالاكس رايز او بالايمجنج ستاديز لو انفولفنج البوستيرير اليمنت و غالبا ممكن تبقى اوستيوبلاستوما اوستيودوستيوما انيروزمال بون سيست اوستيوكوندروم الاوستيوبلاستوما والاوستيودوستوما تبقى سكلورتيك ليجن وعلى حسب السايز بتاعها تبقى التشخيص لان يوريزم البون سيست بتبقى ليتيك واكسبانسايل والاوستيكوندروم المنظر اللي احنا عارفين بتاع الاوستيكوندروم لو هي انفولفنج مينلي الانتيرير اليمنت تبقى يا جوين سيل تيومر يا هيمانجيوما يا زينوفيلك جرانيلوما زينوفيلك جرانيلوما ممكن تبقى ان ذا فورم اوف فيرتيبرا بلانا والهيمانجيوما بيبقى فيها كورس فيرتيكال تروبيك الجوين سيل تيومر بتبقى ليتيك اكسبانسايل انتيرير انفولفنج الانتيرير اليمنت الاوستيوكوندروما زي الحاله اللي احنا شايفينها دي بنقسمها الاوستيوكوندروما سيمتوماتيك ونون سيمتوماتيك لو هي سيمتوماتيك والاوستيوكوندروما ما تبقى في الاجزيا السكيلتون بنخاف ان هي يحصل لها مالجنان ترانسفورميشن الحاله دي كانت بريزنتد تو اس بانكومبليت ريموفل والسيمتوماتيك بتبقى يا اما ان هي ضغط على نيرف يا اما بتافكت الفانكشن due to its size فاحنا عملنا لها anterior intraregional resection شلنا الستوك واهم حاجه تشيل الكاب وانت شغال عشان ده سايت اوف مالجنت ترانسفورميشن دي حاله ثانيه كانت اوستيوكوندروما وكانت بارت من مالتيبل هيرديتري اكزوستوزس وبقت كوندروساركوما يعني زي ما بون سيست دي الحاله اللي احنا كنا لسه عارضينها وبنعمل بري اوبريتيف امبولايزيشن والمفروض بنعمل آه الكيرتاج بتاعنا حاله ثانيه نفس الكلام تباليتيك اكسبانسايل ممكن واكيد برضو بنشوفها كتير قوي في السكر والديفرنت موداليتيز اوف تري ال الايزينوفيل الجرانيلوما بتبريزنت فيرتيبرا بلانا احنا ما بنعملش حاجه للفيرتيبرا بلانا كونزرفاتيف uh, وبنلبس العيان بريس بس لازم تاخد في بالك ان الفيرتيبرا بلانا مش بتيجي بس مع الايزينوفيل الجرانيلوما ممكن تيجي مع الايونج ساركوما و other malignant lesions. 
فالاول تشخص ان هي ايزينوفيلك جرانيولوما بعد كده بتفولو اب وتلبس العين بريس ممكن نعمل انجكشن و بن بنعمل لو هي كومبليكيتد ساعتها ممكن نعمل بوستيرير فيكسيشن الهيمانجيوما من الحاجات اللي بتبقى معظمها مالتيبل ومن من الديفرنشال دايجنوز اوف مالتيبل ليجنز انفولفينج السباين وبتبقى برايت تي 1 برايت تي 2 يهمنا قوي في الهيمانجيوما اللي هي الاتيبيكال هيمانجيوما اللي هي ما بتبقاش دارك بتبقاش برايت تي 1 برايت تي 2 ودي ساعتها تحتاج بايوبسي مش كل عينين الهيمانجيوما بنعمل لهم بايوبسي الحالات الاتيبيكال والحاجه الثانيه اللي هي ال 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 السيمتوماتيك وان وزي ما دكتور وفاء قال ان هي بتزيد مع البريجنسي وبنشوف المنظر ده اللي هو البولكا دوكت اللي هو منظر الاسترايشن اللي احنا شايفين الاسترايشن في الفيرتيكال استرايشنز والبولكا دوت ابييرنس اخر حاجه طبعا في السيمتوماتيك ان هي تكون الهيمانجيوما كسرت وساعتها الرول بتاع الفيرتيبرو بلاستي بيبقى مفيد في الحالات دي دي حاله من الاتيبيكال هيمانجيوما زي ما احنا شايفين ان هي مش برايت الاوستيوبلاستوما التيب اللي احنا عايزين نقولها ان في الام ار اي مي مي شو هاي سيجنال سراوندنج والسوفت تيشو بتاعها فالسي تي بيبقى احسن في الاوستيود اوستيوما في الاوستيوبلاستوما بيبقى فيها دوتس اوف كالسيفيكيشنز الاوستيود اوستيوما زي ما شفنا حالات بتبقى معاها سكوليوزس والسكوليوزس دوت جاست ان انت شلت النايدس السكوليوزس ده بيرزولف وزين 6 مانثس ادي منظر النايدس ولازم تبقى متاكد جدا ان انت بتهت الايه النايدس لو انت اشتغلت سيرجيكال انما لو ممكن تعمل لها هيت ابليشن لو هي مش قريبه من النير حاله ثانيه اكبر شويه وكان معاها تورتي كولز والحاله ديت عملنا لها هيت ابليشن بس دكتور عمرو ناصف استاذ الانترفيشن راديولوجي عشان الكورد التيب دي عملها ان هو حقن هواء الاول وبعد كده عمل لها هيت ابليش الباجيت ديزيز احنا بنقوله مع التيومرز عشان ان هو الباجيت ديزيز ممكن المالجنت ترانسفورميشن يعمل باجيت ساركوما وتاني وتاني حاجه اللي هو المنظر بتاعه ان هو بيمستيك كتير في الديفرنشال دايجنوز بتاع المالجنت تيومرز الكوردوما هاي سيجنال في تي 1 هاي سيجنال مور مور هاي سيجنال في تي 2 وعلى حسب بقى السايز بتاعها والسايد بنشوف هنعمل سكريكتوميز ولا اول بوستير ولا انتير بوستير وطبعا الستاندرد اوف كير ان احنا بنعمل وايد اكسترا ليجنال ريسكشن التيب برضو الوحيدة أي ليجن بتشوفه مش لازم يبقى انفكشن يعني الليجن ده اتفتح على انه انفكشن وفي الآخر طلع أوسيو ساركوم اتس دون اتس اوفر ان العيان يتفتح مهما انت بعد كده اديته كيمو او راديو او اي حاجة وانس ان هو العيان اتفتح غلط فانت دايما تمشي بالرولز وتاخد بايوبسي وعلى حسب البايوبسي تشتغل دي عيانه برضو اتفتحت غلط وعلى وهي طلعت في الاخر اوسيو ساركوما عملنا لها باليتيف دي كومبريشن اوف فيكسيشن نفس الكلام الكوندرو ساركوما من الحاجات من الديفرنشال دايجنوزز للليجنز اللي بتيجي في السكرم وكاركترستيك ليها الدوتس اوف كالسيفيكيشنز اللي باينه فيها دي بيبقى باثوجونوميك ليها اللي هي الاكسنتريك سيكرال ماس والرول طبعا اوف كيمو اوف راديو فيها قليل جدا فلازم الوايد ريسكشن بلازما سايتوما والمالتيبل مايلوما ديت حاجات كيمو سنستيف وراديو سنستيف وما بنعمل لهاش بروسيجرز الا لو هي عامله انستابيليتي غير كده هي كيمو وراديو سنستيف نفس الكلام في الليمفوما 
سباينال ميتس في برنسبلز دي اهم حاجه في ان انت بتتعامل مع عيان سباينال ميتاسيس اول حاجه الكيور ان انت لازم تبقى انت فاهم والعيان فاهم واهل العيان فاهمين ان انت يو دونت كيور ذا بيشنت انت جاست ان انت بتبالييت البيشنت تو هاف ا بيتر كواليتي اوف لايف لايف اكسبكتنسي ان انت على حسب اللايف اكسبكتنسي بتاعت العيان بتجو فور سيرجري على والاكستنت بتاع السيرجري بتاعتك على حسب اللايف اكسبكتنسي بتاعت العيان دونت كومبليكيت ذا اوريدي كومبليتيد بيشنت بمعنى ان انت بتنقل العيان من مربع لمربع عيان رائد في السرير وانت هتخليه يقعد تمام عيان قاعد وانت هتخليه يمشي يبقى انت بتنقله من مربع لمربع بتمبروف الكواليتي اوف لايف اوف بيشنت تاني حاجه الرول مهم جدا مفيش لامينكتومي بس اللامينكتومي بس بتعمل كايفوزس وبتدخل العيان في نيورولوجي بعد كده فاتليست لو انت هتعمل لامينكتومي تعمل معاها سنجل ليفل فيكسيشن تالت حاجه مش كل عيان اولد مش كل عيان اولد يبقى العيان ده متستس بنشوف كتير جدا وجراحين سباين يشوفوا اي عيان عنده تيومر وعيان كبير في السن يقول لك ده عنده ده متاسس ممكن يبقى مايلوما ممكن يبقى ليمفوما ممكن يبقى برايمري تاني حاجه التايم فاكتور از امبورتنت الاكزامينيشن بتاع العيان مهم جدا ما تبصش على الاشعاعات دايما العيان السباين تيومرز بتلاقي اهل العيان جاي لك بالاشعاعات يقول لك رايك ايه يا دكتور نعمل ايه وكده الاكزامينيشن مهم جدا يعني لو حد شاف الليجن ده يقول خلاص اخش واعمل بوستير دي كومبريشن تيجي تبص على العيان بعد كده تعمل له اكزامينيشن تلاقي ان هو عنده سكين انفكشن وما ينفعش يتفتح في في الوقت الحالي. الوينكينج اول ساين برضه دي بتفرق معانا قوي او بنلاحظها ان احنا دايما عيان جاي ببلين اكس ريز والبين بتاعه الوينكينج اول زي اللي هي البومه المغمضه عينيها فنلاقي ان في بيديكال في ناحيه ومفيش بيديكال في الناحيه الثانيه. دي برضه تديك ممكن يكون عامل جاي من غير سي تي او ام ار اي تديك ان في مشكله في هذا المكان. بيركوتينيس بايوبسي دايما خد بايوبسي السكورنج سيستمز الخلاصه بتاعتها احنا عندنا سكورنج سيستمز بتقول العيان ده يتفتح ولا لا ولو اتفتح يعمل حاجه كبيره ولا لا والحاجه الثانيه السكورنج الثانيه هي الحاجات اللي في السيرجري عشان اما اجي اوصف اوصف التيومر او اللي حد ده في البادي مش في البادي اكستند للبيديكال واخد للكنال او كده نقطه الانستابيليتي العيان مش لازم يبقى مكسور بس فيه سكورز ثانيه معموله فور انستابيليتي انا بستخدم الكوست والكلاسيفيكيشن ببساطه جدا انت بتيجي في السي تي بتقسم السباين لست مربعات لو الليجن انفولفنج الليجن انفولف اكتر من ثلاث مربعات ده Unstable spine. If I have a little mingus. Thank you. تمام شكرا جزيلا دكتور هيثم سو ذس از ذا اند اوف اور ساينتفيك ميتنج ناو ايد لايك تو ثانك ذا اول ذا اتنديز ايذر اون لاين اور هو كيم فيزيكالي تو اتند ذس ميتنج اند ان شاء الله هوب تو سي يو اجين ان ذا نيكست اكتيفيتي وي ويل ران ان ذا ان ذس مانث عندنا الايجيبشن سباين اسوسيشن وهيبقى في اي او سباين ميتنج بتكفر السباين انفكشن وان شاء الله احتمال برضه في 12 يبقى عندنا ريسيرش ورك شوب هيبقى على مدى حتى ثلاث ايام وهيبقى في كمان ان شاء الله احتمال كبير زي ريسيرش فورم اللي مسجل من حضراتكم ماجستير او دكتوراه ويحب يجي يقدم البروتوكول بتاعه ونسكاس معاه تبقى حاجة ظريفة كده إن شاء الله. طبعًا أنا بحب أشكر شركة يوتوبيا على السبورت اللي اديته لنا النهاردة ودكتورة أميرة on behalf of يوتوبيا عاوزة بس تأناونس على حضراتكم يعني بعض المعلومات عن الشركة.
دكتورة أميرة تفضلي شكرا ميرسي يا دكتور مساء الخير أنا دكتورة أميرة كمال ديستريكت مانجر في شركة يوتوبيا برحب بحضوركم النهاردة وإحنا لينا الشرف إن إحنا النهاردة نكلمكم عن برودكت بتاعنا عن الدلوكسبرين A New Era in Management of Neuropathic Pain الأجندة يعني in just كده in 10 minutes uh, in brief هتكلم عن the prevalence with burden of a neuropathic pain signs and the symptoms of a neuropathic pain the guidelines uh, with the FDA recommendation in neuropathic pain وليد دلوكسبرين هو الأيديال تشويس لحالات neuropathic pain أه لو جينا نتكلم عن البريفلنس هنلاقي ان من 16 ل 55% من حالات الكرونيك لو باك بين عندها بوسيبل نيوروباثيك كومبوننت الريلاتيف كونتريبيوشن اوف نيوروباثيك ميكانيزم بتزيد اكوردنج للديجري اوف الديستال بين راديشن الساينز اند السيمتومز اوف نيوروباثيك بين بيبقى عباره عن نومنس او تينجلينج ان فيت اند اور هاند بيرنينج اور شوتينج سنسيشن ان افكتد اريا لوس اوف بالانس اند كوردينيشن Muscle weakness, especially in the feet. طبعا ال burden of neuropathic pain بيأثر على ال working ability with daily activity. بي بيعمل depression and anxiety. بيأثر على ال ability to sleep. لما هاجي هعمل management ل neuropathic pain محتاجة دواء يكون واخد FDA approval, واخد Health of Canada approval, و ال EMA approval, و guidelines recommendation. ال guidelines زي NICE و EULAR و European Journal of Pain مدي recommendation لل deluxeprene as first line treatment level of evidence A. بعكس الجابابنتن اللي هو بيحتاج gradual titration with those من 1800 ل 3600 associated with neuropathy. ليه الدلوكسبرين هو الايديال تشويس لحالات النيوروباثيك بين؟ اول حاجه هنتكلم فيها عن الدلوكسبرين ميكانيزم اوف اكشن والدلوكسبرين افيكاسي والدلوكسبرين افيكاسي اون كواليتي اوف لايف والدلوكسبرين فيرسز الاذرز والادمنستريشن. الدلوكسبرين بيشتغل بديول ميكانيزم اوف اكشن سنترال كاس ان ار اي بيشتغل في الدورسال هورن في سباينال كورد عن طريق ان هو بينهبت الاسندنج بين باث واي وبريفرال عن طريق ان هو بيعمل بينهبت النيورو اميون ميكانيزم ودوت بيبقى ميكانيزم اكومبانينج النيرف دامج وبالتالي انا بمنع فارذر دامج للنيرف الدلوكسبرين افيكاسي هنلاقي ان كل الترايز اللي اتعملت على الدلوكسبرين واللي اتنشرت في النيورو ساينس او الايروبيان جورنال اوف بين اتعملت على 401 بيشنت بينت ان في سيجنيفيكانت ريدكشن للبين فروم فيرست ويك تيل ذا اند اوف ذا ترايل والكلام دوت موجود في الايروبيان جورنال اوف بين 2016 والكنديان بين سوسايتي 2014 والنايس 2019 الدلوكسبرين ما بيأثرش على الديلي اكتيفيتي ما بيأثرش على الابيليتي تو درايف بيحسن المود ويقلل الانكزايتي ما فيش منه ريسك اوف ابيوز ديبندنس الدلوكسبرين ليه سوبيريور افيكاسي فيرسز اذر ميديكيشن يوزد فور نيوروباثيك بين لان هو واخد اف دي اي ابروفل بعكس الجابابنتن او البريجابلين مش واخد اف دي اي ابروفل دوز ريكومنديشن في جايد لاينز هي ستارتنج دوز 30 ملي جرام وبعد اسبوع ممكن نرفع ل 60 ملي جرام وانس ديلي بعكس الجابابنت من 1200 ل 1800 ديفايد على ثلاث او اربع جرعات في اليوم بيحسن المود والديلي اكتيفيتي بعكس الجابابنت بيديكريز الديلي اكتيفيتي ما فيش منه ريسك اوف ابيوز ديبندنس بعكس طبعا الجابابنت اللي هو مينلي اديكتد دوس ادجستمنت انا بالنسبه للرينال والالدرلي بيشنت مش بحتاج اعمل دوس ادجستمنت بتاخد لحد جي اف ار 30 ملي بير منت بعكس الجابابنت طبعا لازم اتاخد من اول 60 ملي بير منت وما بيتاخدش اكتر من 65 سنه في الالدرلي بيشنت الدلوكسبرين متوفر في تو باكج ال 30 ملي جرام المونثلي كوست ب 132 حاليا وال 60 ملي جرام المونثلي كوست 162 ده السعر الجديد وبيتاخد ات ميل تايم طبعا افوردبل مونثلي كوست في الفتره اللي احنا فيها دي وكده الدلوكسبرين يقدر يعمل شيفت للبيشنت فروم بين تو هابينس ميرسي لحضراتكم شكرا شكرا جزيلا دكتورة أميرة على البرزنتيشن طيب أنا عاوز أسألك سؤال دكتورة أميرة ساعات يعني في سم بيشنتس يعني في كتير من البيشنتس بيتوليريت الميديكيشن كويس في سم بيشنتس يجي يقول لك أنا أول ما خدت الديلوكستين أو كده حسيت إن أنا في دنيا غير الدنيا وقلبي 
بدا يرفرف وببقى مش شايف قصادي او كده فهل في حاجه مثلا نعملها هل في تايتريشن هل في ريكومنديشن معينه انا وانس ان هو بيشتكي بقول له وقفه بصراحه بس ده دول قليلين من العينين بس ايه الريكومنديشن بتاعته هو احنا يعني عشان السيتويشن ده احنا اوريدي السنه الجديده هنبدا بتركيز ال20 ملي جرام فبرضه علشان السايد افكت اللي احنا بنلاقيها بس هي ما بتبقاش نسبتها كبيره يعني بتبقى ممكن اقل من 10% كمان البالبيتيشن برضه دي انا ما قابلتهاش كتير بس انا في دكاتره بسيطه قالت لي عليها بس هو بتبقى اول اسبوع يعني هو اول اسبوع من جرعه ال 30 وبعد كده بيشنت جسمه هيتعود بس هو سيف تماما كل السيفتي ترايلز اللي اتعملت مدتها 52 اسبوع ودي كانت اكبر ترايلز اتعملت على الدلوكستين فبطمن حضرتك ان هي يعني ما بتبقاش ليها سيجنيفيكانت يعني ماجنيتيود يعني بالنسبه لل يعني مش هت تسول اكتر من كده هي بس في الاول ولو احنا اسبوع وعايزين نرفع ل 60 نرفع لو البيشنت ارتاح على ال 30 ممكن نكمل على ال 30 عادي بس تمام شكرا جزيلا انا نحب ان احنا ناخد كلنا جروب فوتو مع بعض ممكن يعني حتى ورا السكرين كده تبقى قدام السكرين يعني وتبقى السكرين خلفيتنا تبقى ظريفه ان شاء الله اتفضلوا يا شباب Thank <laughs> you.